member is hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the Environment and Regeneration Committee, which will be held by a hybrid socially distanced meeting uh, conducted remotely via WebEx and also physically in the main hall at McGill on Wednesday, the 13th of October 2021 at 4 p.m. If we can move to the roll call, Alderman Morris Devaney. Here. Alderman Derek Hussey. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Here, Connor. Alderman David Ramsey. Here, Connor. Councillor John Boyle. Line, Connor. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Online, Connor. Councillor Stephen Edwards. Here, Connor. Councillor Rachel Ferguson. Online, Connor. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Sure. Councillor Dan Kelly. Councillor Emma McGinley. Uh, online, Connor. Councillor Ray McHugh. Sure. Councillor Maeve O'Neill. Online, Connor. And Councillor Brian Tierney. Okay. Members, um, I'd like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. This webcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. If you are seated in the lower public seating media areas, it is possible that the recording cameras will capture your image and this will result in the possibility that your image will become part of the broadcast. This may infringe your human and data protection rights and if so, yeah, and if you wish to avoid this, you should move to the upper public gallery. Thank you, Connor, for that. Um, these are all very welcome members to uh, October's Environment and Regeneration Committee. Um, item four is members' declarations of interest. Members would like to declare them now, or else you can declare them in the chat box as we go through uh, today's agenda. I'll just declare I'm a member of Zero Waste Northwest because I know there's um, wet recycling stuff coming up. That's Councillor O'Neill, is it? Sorry, right, Councillor O'Neill. Right. Yes, so you, can I declare an interest in item number 25? Item number 25, Councillor Tierney declares an interest. Councillor O'Neill, could you just repeat again that the item that you had an interest in? Sorry, yeah, item number 22, um, just as a member of the group, it's non-pecuniary. Item 22 for Councillor O'Neill. Okay, members, and can I just advise members that for item 17, uh, the mobile update, it is down for information. However, we do require, as was previously requested, uh, a nomination onto the uh, sort of steering group stakeholders, stakeholders group sorry uh, one party one from each party and an independent member so we'll take that um, just before we go on to confidential so if party leaders or party members can maybe come forward with names when we get to that um, members will move on now to uh, chairperson's business um, a couple of members have contacted me uh, prior to today's meeting. Um, I'll take them in order. Um, first of all, we have uh, Alderman Devaney and then Alderman Kerrigan, if he, if he still wishes to raise an issue. So, uh, Arnie Gomars. Thank you, Chair, for uh, allowing me in on your chairperson's business. Uh, and, Chair, um, I don't know whether this is the right committee or not, but we discussed this, but um, I'm going to open it out here. I've been contacted by the Learmount community out uh, in park and regarding uh, a small football pitch area uh, and sort of play area. And they have requested myself um, to maybe uh, bring it uh, to front of officers to see if there be any possibility that council maybe would take over the ground through a lease or whatever way it is. But I'm asking maybe chair that a report be brought back to the relevant committee um, regarding this. I know Aidan Lynch has been uh, in contact with me and he is to have discussions with the Learmount one, but uh, I would like maybe a report to come back to see what we could do out there for the Learmount community. Thanks, Chair. 
Chair, happy to take that and ensure that the report is brought back to the appropriate committee. Okay, uh, is Councillor Kerrigan online? Yes, yes, Chair. And, and I will come in now if that's okay, Chair. But very briefly, Chair, um, it's, it's in regards to the uh, play park there and Parkside there on the Seine Road and Seine Mills. And uh, we know, noticed the, the, the official opening there on uh, on on Friday past there. Now, um, I will raise it now, but I'll be I'll very, very brief. Chair, um, I, I was there uh, in good time uh, at the opening uh, um, for a change. I was in good time, but we uh, and I stayed about after and after everybody had cleared off and, and, and the vast majority was away and photographers and all was away, spent a bit of time around the play park. Now, uh, a couple of issues. There was, there was a, a council officer that was with me and uh, we were just talking and discussing with uh, actually she was speaking to two to two young children there and they, they proceeded to talk away to us and one of them was eight and one of them was nine but as she was we were we were there and you know standing as we we're chatting to the two girls noticed glass broken glass under one of the attractions uh you, you know one of the one of the the, the play, uh, play pieces of play equipment broken glass I picked it up along with the council officer and along with another adult that was there. Picked up the glass, disposed of the glass. That was all right. Now we spoke to the girls as well, and I know that there is the. Um, it's, it's it's a very wooden effect to play park in there. You know, it's all it's all seems to be a wooden effect or wooden wooden play um, pieces of equipment, and um, the the padded or the the, the safety and kiss for the children fallen underneath the swings and various items there predominantly they're a plastic uh, heavy plastic but it's a, a it's a wooden effect on it and then there's a lot of wood chips throughout the rest of it now again as we were standing and myself and another council officer and and, and uh, listening to the girls as they were chatting to us you know i looked down and there was a big lump of wood there over a foot long and it was amongst the rest of the rest of the wood chip stuff there and i was informed that it was meant to have been safety or you know play a, a play grade stuff that it wouldn't cause any effect but i mean that was just in the middle of it i know we work with a bit of that wood chip there for bedding for stock and you have to go through it with a rake because there are the chances of larger pieces on it and i mean that was a large jagged bit over a foot long and i mean i didn't go looking for it it was there at my feet so i didn't look through the whole rest of it to see what there was now we continued, Chair, to discuss with just chatting and the two wee girls were very open and were very open and talking to us. They did make mention as well, Chair, of um, one of them stated that their mammy had come out and had had to chase some older young people who were drinking in the park on one night. Now, this is what I was saying, just repeating what the, what the girls have told us. That, and again, that was raised as a, as a potential. Hopefully, as I said, it doesn't come to anything. And um, so those couple of issues. And then, Chair, there's another there's another swing set there whereby an adult can go on the swing along with a very small child uh, you, you know and that there chair uh, man dear sir it was a disaster the, the amount of dog dung and dog fowl there was was unbelievable you, you know and it had been it had been wasn't just in the last day or so i mean i went to the car and i'd got a a black bun bag out and i and that was you, you know You'd have been chatting with it by the time I had put it in there. I'd have filled half a carrier bag, a dog dung that was hooked into and was in there at the at the at us and the wood chip area there and at one of the swings. So you know that's and I, I know the park is well enough secured in regards to the gates. I don't believe an animal could get in without someone bringing it in. But it's it's you know and I mean we know the dangers chair to the issues of of dog fowl and and a brand new play park and a child getting that into their eye or anything like that I mean that's how serious that could be be and the 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 uh, irresponsible dog owner or dog owners who are, who are allowing this to happen but chair the the last issue and I, I do that's a wee bit sensitive here and again i have made council officer uh, you know discussed that there's council officer with was present with me during this entire period and and knows of these issues and i did make the police aware of the issues as we were chatting the girls were on a set of swings then and they did make mention there's a little hut and they did make mention to us of older people being in the wee hut and videoing them 
Now, I was very, very concerned when they told us that. And we advised them that if they've seen anything like that at all, they're to go and tell their parents that away. But I, now I say I'm not exactly sure, you know, what age, but there is a wee hut on there. And it's a wee bit with, you know, and I was concerned about that chair. I definitely was. And I say I have notified the PSNI, the neighbourhood team, in regard to potential. As, as I say, just relaying what we've been told, that there was potentially, there could be some young people potentially drinking on it. And this issue of... If people are recording, uh, you, you know, all there's on the play park. So as I say, it's just these couple of issues there. I'm just not content with And I just wanted that relayed there. As I say, welcome the investment. Welcome the park being opened. I mean, it's great to have a facility and the, um, and the game chair and our own DEA chair and investment. That's too, uh, you know, with, with Morn Park and Newton Stewart and now, now uh, Parkside there. But, chair, I do have concerns in regards to these issues and again it's something i'm going to have to look at with with the dog warden or trying to do something in regards to it but that's that's just the issues as it stands here thank you very much thank you councillor kerrigan um, i'll ask connor just to come on at this stage chair sure, thanks for that um as alderman kerrigan um, has said there's a significant invest investment in the area and we're certainly keen to see that uh, the young people in the area um, enjoy it and, and are able to enjoy it safely and freely. With regard to the park, um, I'll have the uh, the team go back and, and rake the park. Now, that forms part of our regular maintenance, um, and it's done frequently, um, certainly um, on a regular basis by uh, the park, the team that inspect the, the play area. So I can get that dealt with, uh, with, with immediate effect. I know that the community safety wardens and the PSNI um, have both gone and visited the park on a number of occasions since it opened. I know that they've both had conversations with some of the young people. Um, and again, you know, if there are any issues, that's the appropriate channels that they're dealt with. Um, in terms of the issue with the dog footing, I'll bring that to the attention of the dog wardens and ask if they pay uh, particular attention to that. But as you say, um, it's likely that you know the gates were open to, to bring the dog and that's a bigger issue. And, and again, it's back to responsible um, dog owners. But certainly, I'll take on board the issues raised, and I'll get back to uh, the member directly with uh, any uh, update in terms of, of the issues. Thank you, Connor. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Sure, thanks for um, letting me in. Unfortunately, I was unable to get to the official opening last week due to, due to being ill, but some of my party colleagues uh, did go, and um, as um, Alder McCarrigan raised there, those issues, especially around the, the dog filing, has been raised with myself, and I've Sent, sent stuff on to the council officers, but um, Connor has basically um, answered the, the questions I had there. But if I could be CC'd on and on uh, any updates on that, uh, Connor, I would be uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards, and, and like yourself, I was unable to make it um, when it was rearranged. I, I would have been able to make it the previous day, but. Mm. It's well seen there's an assembly election in the often when you have MLAs and a minister attending the opening of a play park and saying well. <laughs> but anyway, I'd thank Councillor Kerrigan for raising that issue, a uh, very important issue. Uh, Councillor Tierney. Thanks, Chair. Um, and it's, I suppose, on, on the same issue, maybe a, a question for Connor. Um, I understand um, that the play park in Sam Mills was opened on Friday of last week. Um, according to Alderman Kerrigan, he was there with council officers. Today is Wednesday, and it's only now we're saying that we're going to rake, rake through the, the park, look at the glass, and speak to the dog warden. Has Councillor Kerrigan or the officers not raised this before today? And if they have, what have we done between then and now to try and get this addressed? Because there's almost five days there that this play park has been open and children have been allowed on this. Thank you. Chair, before any facility is open, there's a Rosp inspection carried out on it, so that would have been completed in advance of the play area opening. And any issues that were you know, noticed at that point in time would have been dealt with, and that would include inspecting the park and all of the other issues. Um, I, I, you know, I haven't spoken to the officer, but I'd imagine that the issues have been dealt with at this stage, but I'll follow up and certainly advise all of the members on the Derg area of the outcome of uh, the various um, investigations and considerations. Okay, members, that takes us on to our, our next item, which is today's presentation. Um, we have Mr. Jerry Kelly from the Silent Majority Community Group online regarding um, road mining issue. Um, 
I would just remind members that uh, Council corporately do you have a, had or have a position on this. Um, however, that doesn't obviously prevent members from airing their views or asking questions as per normal. So I just ask members because I know it's quite a, an emotive issue for some members to to uh, keep their comments uh, brief and respectful at all times. So I'd like to welcome Jerry and uh, invite you to address the members. Jerry, go ahead. You're there. Well, members, it seems that uh, Mr. Kelly is not online at the minute, and we don't have any apologies from him. So um, perhaps maybe he's having difficulty with his IT or something. But uh, in the meantime, we may uh, just a message here that he's waiting to get in. So we'll we'll give a couple of minutes to try and get him into the meeting here, folks. If you don't mind. <laughs> Okay, uh, members, he's trying to, he's clicking on the wrong link, so we'll just give it a few minutes to try and get this sorted out, so bear with us. Thank you. Members, while we're tra trying to get that sorted, um, can we move on maybe and just we'll do uh, item seven, which is matters arising uh, from our previous meeting. Um, so we'll do that now. So that's uh, matters arising, uh, pages 13 to 26. Is there any member who wishes to raise an issue? So, Neil, are you wishing to raise uh, an issue under matters arising? Um, yes, I um on ER two six nine, uh, stroke two one. I was just on the, yeah, yeah, just on the rights of nature, um, update. Um, there is to be a you know a, a public consultation, um, or workshop done, um, in October and November, and I just haven't had, I haven't seen any um advertising of the October workshop. And then it was just within the within the minutes as well. Um, I had made points uh, that the briefing paper uh, contained within those minutes had left out the drawn up um, of a declaration for the rights of nature as per the motion, and just also made the point um, which wasn't recorded in the minutes that we can't say whether Council Waller will not be able to legally implement the rights of nature approach as this is you know this is being explored. Um, and just then, additionally, I had also updated that. Kind of one other council, which was Oma and Fermanagh District Council, had also passed um, a similar motion recognising rights of nature, and two other councils were um, at the committee stage of this um, in the north. So it was just um, correcting the minutes there, uh, but I know I might be too late in doing that potentially. Um, but just an update on the public uh, meeting. 
Thanks. Chair, the officer team are uh, pulling together the details of those two workshops as requested. Um, as soon as we confirm the arrangements will circulate um, to all the members and advise of uh, the details and the content and so on. Thanks for that, Connor. Um, Can I just check, Connor? Is that unlikely to be October then? Sure. Uh, as I understand it, we're trying to get one for this month, but it's just in terms of getting the um, the content pulled together and getting the, the invites out in time. Okay, Councillor Neil. Uh, with Councillor, or sorry, Alderman Hussey under matters arising, ER 254 slash 21. Go ahead, Alderman. Uh, thank you, Chair, and apologies for late arrival. As I said in the chat box, uh, difficulties getting connection I'm here now. Um, two, 254 is the brown bins. Um, it's just a general question that. Is it the intention of council to rule out the brown bin service to 100% of the area or not? Or is there targeting uh, of particular areas? I, I happen to live in a rural area. I don't have a brown bin, haven't been supplied with one. You know, will I be supplied with one? And will my neighbours at some stage be supplied with one? Just wondering what the, the programme would be. Thank you, Chair. Sure, yeah, happy to address that. The intention is to provide brown bins to all those that accommodate them or can accommodate them. Obviously, there'll be apartments and you know, terraced houses, houses without gardens that can't necessarily accommodate a bin. But the intention is that uh, to, to have full coverage across the city and district where we can uh, provide them. We're working on a rolling basis now, so we're continually adding to um, collection routes and assist the logistics and fine tuning of, of ensuring that we have vehicles able. Uh, with sufficient capacity to collect as we add on the guns, but certainly that's the intention. Appreciate it, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Connor. And Councillor Ramsey on the same issue. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just uh, on the situation of brown buns, um, I remember the smaller buns. There used to be um, a label you put on to get bags left. I was wondering, uh, could them labels be distributed uh, because people are having difficulty getting bags because they don't have a label they put on the bun they let the boys know they need bags um, which is going to cause issues down the line and I was wondering if that could be rolled out thank you yeah, Chair, happily take that. When when the bins are distributed, uh, those labels are provided with them. But um, if there are people who need them, if they contact us, we can certainly make sure we provide the uh, labels to them. Thanks, um, sorry, Alderman Ramsey, you want back? Sorry, in? sorry. Uh, I don't think that everyone everyone got the labels for definite because of the people on looking labels or looking to know how they get the bags. So, are are you saying that basically put out there publicly, anyone who hasn't got labels, they they get in touch? Yeah, chair. If they contact us, we'll provide them with a label. But when the bins are distributed, we distribute it with an information leaflet that explain the collections. Plus, the yellow tag is is provided with us. Now, it may be that people didn't appreciate what it was when it was delivered, but the tags are provided with the delivery of the bin. Thank you, chair. Connor. Councillor Ferguson, same issue. Yeah, thank you, Chair Connor. Just really quickly, um, I know you have been dealing with um, the rollout of the big brown bins, especially in apartments, and there's been a few niggles and issues. I had one recently um, where people in the whole, all the apartments are using a number of different bags rather than the biodegradable bags for their food waste. And unfortunately, I think that's going to then lead to the one big bin not be collected so residents are a bit worried that some of them might be penalized because all the residents in the area may, i'm just wondering what would what's the best advice we give do we just you know read disseminate some leaflets on how it needs to be the the biodegradable bags especially in the apartment complexes or you know um i suppose just your advice on that would be great thank you yes chair unfortunately um unless it's in a biodegradable bag um 
be it can't be collected and the crews will, will reject bins on that basis. I appreciate that it can be difficult where you have uh, apartment blocks. Um, and in general, there's uh, some kind of a management arrangement in place where, where they deal with those issues. Um, but you know, we provide um, the um, biodegradable sacks uh, as part of the collection service. So if it's a case that people don't have them and make contact with us, then we certainly can provide them to them. The, all, the other alternative in the short term is to wrap them in paper, which is biodegradable um, as a short term measure. Um, but again, if you provide the details, we can get some of the officer team to call with the apartment block and provide additional information or explain the service to the residents. Thanks, Ron Neil. Same issue. Thanks, Chair. Um, I suppose, that, like, obviously, we're transitioning um, from uh, the small cat A brown bin to the big uh, wheelie bin for some households, but not all households. Um, but you know, just given that we're transitioning, there is teething problems, and sometimes um, that system isn't suitable for for everyone. And uh, you know, so I, I'm not so uh, totally certain of the scenario that Councillor Ferguson is describing. Um, but is there a shared big brown uh, bun uh, in the apartment block? And um, you know, I can imagine uh, the biodegradable bags probably rip, so there may be uh, difficulties with a shared big brown bin in the apartment block. So is there? Like, are we looking at, you know, where it's working well, where it's not working well, and do we need to revert back to the small caddy ban for apartments, or, or like, you know, how are we getting that feedback, and and will that uh, uh, feedback be reported uh, back to us, you know, given that I think I don't know how how far we and our how many months we're into the transition um, of this, but you know, when when do we stop and look at that and uh, and respond effectively? Yeah, sure. The issue uh, with, with apartment blocks is not just with um, you know the size of bins, but it's also there are limited facilities within um, these areas for, for bin storage, and that's a bigger issue. Now, in the more, I suppose, modern developments, there's a recognition that bin storage has to be uh, something that's considered at an early stage and adequate provision made. Um, but we do have a collection service that's uh, we can't, we, which we try our best to uh, accommodate. Um, all the uh, different um, collection arrangements. Um, there's there's only a limit to what we can provide. Um, so you know, we work and certainly provide information to residents, um, and uh, we you know, assist where we can. But there's also an obligation on residents to ensure that they're using the collection systems that we provide properly and and can um, you know deal with any issues on a collective basis. But certainly, I mean, if if, if individual uh, properties where there are difficulties. I mean, we have details of those. We can send some of the officers to to talk through the issues with the residents and try and come up with a solution that will work for them. And finally, uh, Alderman De Valley on the same issue. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, just a response uh, um, to the 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 yellow the wee yellow labels that you tie on for the. For the extra, for the bags to be left, I know where I live here. Um, I see. Look, we don't all of those labels because they 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 tear uh, and they disintegrate. But I do see what is up, what is working out here. If you have one of the the wee bags that, that you put the food into, if you tie one of those onto the bins here, uh, you know, in your buildings, the the the, the guys in the lorry will generally leave one off or tie a plastic bag. Oh, onto one of the bins, and that generally works for those who need ones in an emergency. Just to say that's how it works for us right here. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Alderman Devaney. Members, um, I'm informed now that we have our, our presenter now online. Um, so again, I'd just like to, to welcome Jerry Kelly on behalf of the silent majority. And again, reiterate members to try and keep their remarks as brief as possible and respectful as possible. So you're very welcome, Jerry, and the, the floor is yours. I think you're on mute there, Jerry, if you'd unmute yourself. If you can hear us, Jerry, you're on mute. Don't seem to hear us. Can you hear me now? Hello? We can hear you now, Jerry. 
Uh, I'd just like to start off with thanking you for taking your time out to meet with me this evening. And I'd like to have an apology from Aaron, who was called away last thing this evening. So it's left me on my own. So you'll have to bear with me. I just want me the greatest to stop doing the likes of this. But uh, I think you have somebody there that's doing the slides for me anyway, if you can manage to pull them up to slide one. Uh, see now. Because that's, yep, that's it. Uh, we are the Silent Majority, a group that has come together since April 2019. Our origins from a local fact finding group that had been around since 2016. And since then, we have developed and have become more organised. We know that there are a lot of great, uh, great people in our locality, and there are different views on the project or on lots of things. But that's what a community is about, and we can all agree to differ in a respectful way and hold on to our own views. Uh, unfortunately, there's a small group who have created a more awkward approach and the attitude and device and intimidate people. It is designed to prevent dialogue, to silence a conversation about the mining and to silence a conversation about what's the Alridian. We want to push back against this. We have the right to speak and we would like others to speak. The council hasn't spoken to a company that's going to bring the largest piece of foreign direct investment in the history of the council area. Uh, slide two, please. Uh, slide two now. Uh, about us. Everyone should have the opportunity to have their say, including on mining. There are differences of opinions, but that should not mean that our opinion should not be heard. Our group has been set up to help dis discussions around mining, and this meeting tonight is an important step in that engagement. Slide three. Now, this Erin, but it's fucking Erin, I say can't be with tonight. Erin isn't here, but as you can see, she is a local and wants to be part of this project. She is out there getting the qualifications that will put her in the right one into the most important areas of the mine, the protection of the environment. Slide four. Back in, 2000, in August 2019, Dalradian made changes to the application which had been very much welcomed in the area. The, the removal of cyanide is definitely a positive move, along with other changes, including a commitment to carbon neutrality and the reduction in use of water. We have definitely noticed that in the local area, there's been a positive response to these changes and concerns. The people did not, the, the people did not have before August 2019 have dealt with. We believe the council should support the project and it's grossly unfair to us and wrong to, for the council to object to it. Slide five. The two pictures, and I'm sure if you look yourselves, you can see the two pictures. The first one was taken in uh, 2011, and the second one is in 2019. And anybody that looks at those two pictures, there's been no change. And they already have been operating now there, there's 10 years. So, you know, you can take. Take it from that on those two pictures. Uh, slide six. We support new investment coming into this area. This investment of 750 million over the lifetime of the mine is a substantial figure. I believe that they will have a powerful and positive impact on not only the drone area, but further afield as well. Let me tell you about my own relations. You no, know, they have a lot of career all over has went to Australia. They, these people are all working in mines in Australia, and it's given them a great initiative to come back home again and stop immigration. They'll be working home for them. Uh, let's see now. Next slide. During COVID, the COVID-19, we, we have seen the Alridian set up and play a massive role in the community response to the up an epidemic. We have used their resources and staff to help out whenever they can. The, the 50,000 donations to Marie Curie has to be a massive help to the charity. The Alradian also have committed 4 million into the community fund. The Alradian fund has an important part to play in local community groups and their activities. We all know the difficulties in fundraising, whatever that be sports clubs or, or, or organizations. A local employer which is willing to provide funding for groups as a positive welcome move. Next slide, please.
uh, the growth. Well, that's basically back to growth and demand for metals. That's back to renewable energy. These metals are all needed and re renewable energy. Renewable energy cannot be done without the likes of your different metals, copper and so on. So mining is a way forward to create, you know, to get the renewable energy up and running. Next slide, please. Responsible mining in Ireland, as you can see yourself there, if you read it there, it gives you all that whole information there on it. You want to give a couple of seconds, just read through that wee bit. Happy with that. And I'll go on to the next slide then. Tara Mines has been in operation for 40 years, and it's in our belief that Pramana Oma Council should go, or well, yourselves and Pramana Oma Council yours, should go and meet up in the mine. We, as a group here, done this and as a very, very useful experience. The mine is in the heart of the, yeah, the, mine is in the, heart of the Boyne Valley, known as the Garden of Ireland, and the Slane Distillery has only 10 miles down the road from it. They use the water from the Boyne for distilling the world renowned whiskey. We have met with different groups down there and representatives of the area, and they fully support the value and economic benefits from the Tara Mines in operation. Next slide, please. Uh, we view this as a first step in the engagement around mining, and we would be grateful for the opportunity to speak. We have a number. We have a number of asks for different councils. Speak to Dalradian. They are local people employed by Dalradian, and they deserve the opportunity to be heard too. Look at other examples out there. As I say, the Tara Mines in Navan. Ask them of their concerns. See how they dealt with it down there. Allow due process. Dalradian deserve their planning application to be heard in an independent manner. They are clearly different views regarding the applications. Uh, just see now. I'll, uh, ah yes, on to the next slide. I'm just uh, I'm just not the best of computers here, so thank uh, right, I'll question now we're down, so it's open to the floor. Jerry, uh, thank you for the presentation. As you say yourself, we'll, we'll now open it up for, for members' comments or questions. Members, our first indicated speaker here is Councillor Gellar. Go ahead, Councillor Gellar. Thank you for letting us in. And thank you, Jerry, for the presentation. I, uh, I'll, I'll try and be as respectful as, as I can be. I, uh, <clears throat> firstly, you, you know, you, you say you're the said majority and, and it's I've, I've been around a council for six years uh, and it's it's the first time I've uh, actually heard of your group uh, and uh, I've been I've been up and around uh, the entire district of Day and Straban and I haven't seen any maybe meetings or any any groupings um and I have a number of questions uh, and one is you know has has this group as you call the silent majority have you had any meetings in the round Greencastle, Gorton, I uh, with uh, local people with local groups, and I uh, and 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 where is that at? Because I, I would take you down uh, and some of the, the experiences that I have is there's almost forty thousand applications, uh, signatures that have gone in opposing this main that Dalradian is looking to put as a main camp up in the middle of uh, Greencastle and, and an area of outstanding natural beauty. And and that plan, uh, within those plans, there is, and there are detailed plans, they're, they're talking about, they're going to burn in the region of 3.3 .3 million diesel, litres of diesel a year. And I'm wondering, can, can your group give guarantees for example, 
just over a kilometre away, there's a number of schools. And you report them that amount of diesel a year, there's going to be air pollution. There's a guarantees that children's safety are going to uh, be guaranteed. Can your group guarantee parents that their children are going to be safe within the immediate vicinity of this of this mine? And I'm wondering, can you uh, can you give us guarantees? This mine mining is going to take out thousands of tons of rock on a daily basis. And if you look across the world at all our summer type mines, we have seen environmental disasters. Disasters that have seen environmental impacts, that have seen loads, even villages wiped out, thousands of people killed. This mine is planning to be there for 25 years. What guarantees can your group give that this will not be the case in Ireland? And I know you didn't mention some other projects in Ireland, but you sort of avoided you know, the, the sinkholes in, in Monaghan, asked maybe the council up around there what, what the crack would be. But, and I'll finish up I, by saying this, it's my belief that where they're planning this mine, where they're going to be digging, where they're going to be mining, where they're going to be causing explosions under the ground, that's going to go from Green Castle, coming down on the Donna going out on the park, but further on down in the day, that over 25 years, this will create a very mild disaster. And Dal Radian, when they're finished, will leave this country plundered, and not give a care about the disaster that they leave behind. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> well, um, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, a first example now, I've I noticed wrote it down here, just to maybe check of, on the uh, objection that there's there. I've just a few, I have a few bits noted down here now. Let's see where it's from here. Yep, back, the most back there started over last year. We had a right wee depth, de and depth look into the objection letters. And we went through them, you know, one by one. And out of Greencastle, Gorge and Ruski, we have 400 objection letters in from the area out of two and a half thousand people. So, you know, where's the majority? We have the majority on that. Now, you're on about blasting and mining and rock and stuff. That one's been going since from 1977. And the, the schools in the there's a shopping center 600 yards from the main. You know, there's a pile of stuff right around the main. There's been no problems. So that's what I, you know, there's no different the two, there's no different the two jobs. They're both in the identical same thing. So they are. But uh, you're on about two units. But three, a pile of paperwork here, Paul, for just forgive me. Yeah, you're on about meetings where we hold the meetings. We have to hold the meetings in places and say numbers. The intimidation from a small group of people in Greencastle, we'll have to keep moving them because we're all being intimidated over it. You know, different houses, basically that's where we meet. And the second majority now has been going this number of years, so I'm quite surprised that you haven't heard from about it. See now, just a little bit of paper wrote down here. Oh yeah, just you're chatting about meetings. We had a meeting last Thursday night, and we had 40 people from 40 different families at that meeting. So add the figures up. So I think, Paul, you yeah, only a couple of questions. That's all I'm answering on that because I want to like, give every other councillor an, op an opportunity to come in. Okay, uh, thanks, Jerry, for that. Um, councillor, or sorry, Alderman Ramsey, um, my apologies. I think you had indicated to, to come in and speak on this as well. So yep. uh, call on Alderman Ramsey now, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, Jerry, for uh, your presentation. I was looking forward to it as this is a presentation that I've, I've actually, it was myself that actually I, I proposed that you be asked to come. Um, because, like, I, I just know there's a silent majority out there. There normally is in these circumstances. Um, and one of the things I was going to ask about is how many letters were from the local area of objection, and you've just uh, outlined there how many letters there is of the immediate area. You know, um, it's of my firm belief that you know uh, the people of that area 
um, should be embracing what is a very positive way forward. Um, and, you know, I'm really glad that we have a silent majority group to basically have it. Well, I know it's, it's too bad. It has to happen, but there, there, are, there has to be a fight back against what, you know, we know is uh, there's lies being told or scaremongering. Um, you know, the many people that grew up in, in Greencastle who are getting good engineering skills, uh, getting good engineering training and are actually employed with this very, let's face it, worldwide company. Great experience and great uh, future. The photographs too, like, you know, re really sort of, you know, make it clear as well that, you, you know, whenever you listen to some of the rhetoric, you would believe that the whole place was just completely destroyed. Um, and it, w people keep talking about this, you know, going on and on. And, you know, we all, we have visited Dal Radian before now, and um, I'm actually going to propose that we visit again. Uh, now that, you know, it's, a, it's about four or five years since we visited there, so it'll do no harm for our councillors to, to go again. Uh, the removal of cyanide, exactly. Uh, you know, the things that people were really, really uptight about. Um, investment and jobs is a big thing here as well. Um, and, you know, whenever we visited, uh, it was quite obvious how much this company is basically governed and, and how much, how good their infrastructure is. Um, community, the community input is amazing. I mean, you know, the, the benefits for the community is there as well. The scaremongering um, that's going on and the lies that's being told. Um, and one thing I do want to propose that our this committee uh, do write a letter to NA Water uh, and uh, forward all recent samples of water quality in the this area over the past number of years, uh, simply to once again allay the lies um, and Councillor Gallagher said it at a council full council meeting that the rivers were being poisoned that there was uh, the rivers were actually being uh, polluted so um, I would ask that our council officers of this committee send a letter and get the information from NA Water just on the, to sort of support what is being said here tonight and uh, uh, being involved in renewables myself, um, just on wind turbines, battery storage and solar, uh, we can't move forward and we can't meet the targets of renewable energy without mining. Um, and the, the thing is, that, you know, uh, are the people who oppose this mining happy enough that we get all the products from another country? That's mining. You know, uh, uh, you know, are we just not allowed to... Um, produce what's needed for the future of saving our planet um you know it's ridiculous some of the stuff that's being said and some of the stuff that's going on and i've been listening to it now for five or six years and i'm really glad that a group has came here tonight and have, has, have actually told well let's face it told of some truth because you know we do have that mine in navin which you know they're able to make whiskey from the the rivers so they're not polluting the rivers um, because of the where you couldn't make whiskey. Uh, so, you know, obviously uh, I have a seconder there, uh, Alderman Devane has seconded that we, we actually get the NA water stats for the area uh, to basically move on from this ridiculous accusations that are being made. Um, and yes, obviously I proposed there as well that we do uh, arrange another meeting at the Dalradian site. So thank you very much, Jerry, and um, I'm really pleased for the for the families in your area who are loving and working there, and are earning a good good loving and uh, the prosperity that this mine is bringing to your area, and will continue and will locally support our renewable industry going forward. Um, in uh, during the climate emergency, thank you very much. Thank you, Alderman. Alderman, can I just ask that you would put that proposal under the chat box for the benefit of, of everybody to, to read? Thank you, Alderman. Um, go ahead, Jerry. I would just like to thank uh, Councillor Rams there. Just it's been on about getting the uh, water samples. We have been chatting ourselves to Northern Ireland Environmental Agency, and they say this last 10 years from Dalradian have started up there, the water isn't as best, it never has been as good. 
you know, that's the farmers. Every man down that valley knows the water has to clean. Everybody's watching themselves. I know it's, it's a blessing that they already come for the river has cleaned up. So just just uh, yeah, thanks for around on about that. But you know, the same thing, you know, the, the public inquiry, you know, all that will go to the public inquiry, and that's what we are pushing. We want to see the public inquiry go go ahead. They will, you know, we'll look forward to going ahead. And then now uh, it's just an hour, but I've just moved down here, so passing over back to me. Uh Dalaridian, West Mining will also mine copper and silver. And if you look at the, the smartphone or laptop, you're more likely contains traces of gold. We need metals for everyday uses. Uh, and with the growth of renewable energy, this is going to be a massive increase in the demand for metals. In Ireland, we have the role to play to be part of our, the green uh, transition and supply and share of metals which are available to us. We should also be relying on metals bringing mine some more. Uh, uh, I, just, I can't read my own writing at times, so you can bear with me. There, uh, let's see where it was. And I'll read in as part of the solution rather than the problem. Okay, Jerry, um, our next speaker now is uh, Councillor Barr. Thank you for having me on, Chair. I'm not a member of this committee, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak. The negative effect of gold mines when you have in our environment has been well documented. The, the effect that we'll have on our rivers, I, mean, I hear Alderman Ramsey and Jerry talking about the, uh, how good the rivers are at the moment. Gold mining hasn't started yet. Once gold mining is in full swing, I have no doubt that the effect that we'll have on our rivers with the decimation of salmon, trout, pear mussels, the potential threat to our children's health. At a time when we're trying to promote and exploit the area of outstanding beauty, which is the spirits, are we going to allow foreign investors who only whose only interest is greed? And make no mistake about it, the only motive they have for coming to these shores is greed. Are we going to allow them the opportunity to divide our communities? And after they've exhausted whatever resources are on the ground, they leave us with a, to a toxic wasteland. As for the already and not being here, they have more access to the media than those who oppose the rape of the country. And Jerry talks about intimidation. The only intimidation I've seen over the fact that five or six years as the intimidation of uh, the people who oppose gold mining and the spirits. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barr. Well, just, to, uh, just to go back to that, the Tara Mines is a fine example. 1977, the Tara Mines is going from, and the water down there has never been polluted. So take it from that. You know, you've brought, you've brought it 20 miles away and you've slain the 10 miles away. Two major places and no problems. So, you know, you take it from that. And Sean O'Neill, our next indicated speaker. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, I, I would have to agree um, wholly with Councillor Barr and uh, Councillor Gallagher. Uh, Jerry, I'm not sure. Uh, I can agree with with much of uh, what you've presented. Um, I've been up to um, Greencastle um, many times, and I have actually witnessed some of the harassment um, on the anti mining uh, uh, er, the protectors in Greencastle. And um, I think, like when we talk about the dull radiant gold mine, we you know, as Councillor Barra says, they have not started mining. Uh, they're only doing exploratory drilling, so it's not reasonable to look at those photographs comparably to what a mine actually looks like. Um, but when we when we talk about the Dalradian mine and compare it to Navan, it's it also is not comparable because we're talking about a mine camp. Um, you know, at the moment the island of Ireland is targeted as a hotspot for mining, um, with like 25% of the north and 27% of the south already uh, concessioned uh, for mining. So, you know, we need to look at the scale of this mine is actually incredibly important because Dalradian are not coming on here to open a nice wee mine. They're here to completely come on and extract and exploit our land um, and then leave in 25 years for um, you know communities to to reap those environmental consequences. And, you know, I think uh, Dalradian's tactics of coming on and, and, you know, investing in the community, but also causing frictions and splitting the community is a tactic of gold mining companies and extracting uh, and of mining companies uh the or, you know all around the world where they you know put the community against each other um you know in the face of uh money and you know it's a tale often told and the thing is like you know the the 
it's just you know like all the community have as each other and their environment you know at the end of the day when uh, when they'll read and get up and go you know the money be gone and the environmental health consequences stay and um they'll read in our are also experts in uh, as well as splitting communities. They're also experts in greenwashing, um, and uh, and you know they they have like laid all these uh, claims about how their their mind will be positive for the environment. But you know, like we have to face it that the the ecological toll and the economic toll of this massive market driven mining expansion, and it's a mine camp. Is like really, um, it's 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 going to have you know serious consequences on um, our efforts to actually mitigate and adapt to the climate crisis. And like we're in a climate crisis um, in terms of solutions to minerals and resources. You know, we we cannot continue um, the the model of overconsumption and uh, endless economic growth. Nor can we pursue the um, the model of continuous and ever more extraction. We need to look at a circular economy where you know the the resources that we have um, that we um, are able to reuse and 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 extract from existing um, materials and resources that we that are already in existence because um, we've already used far too much of the earth's resources um, uh, at the moment and um, yeah just you know in, in terms of like the like we're going to have more extreme weather conditions with the climate crisis and globally we've seen major you know environmental disasters when it comes to to mines with you know toxic waste leaks and and all sorts like again they have not started properly mining they are only doing exploratory drilling so the the disasters or the pollution in the rivers are yet to be seen and i have no doubt that you know whenever these disasters happen i am sure that all the major political parties who are supportive of this mine will be stand beside us not terrible uh, that this disaster has happened and then they'll walk away and it's the communities that are left to have to deal with the consequences of these um, environmental disasters um, on the health and the and the well-being um, of their future generations so jerry that the, the well, you've answered plenty of questions the one question i am asking of you is you know if if there was not a mine there um or a proposed mine there you know what what would you have loved to have seen uh for your local community in terms of bringing um well-being and prosperity to the to the local community that that wasn't a mine that wasn't an uh something that divided the community something that that didn't exploit your land you know what is it <coughs> that you would love to see brought to your local community that wouldn't be mining well to start off with everybody has the right to their own opinion which I agree with. I don't complain about that. And like I'm sure if you've seen harassment, you'd have been complaining about it. Now I'd never come across that. And at the same time, Dalradian will be taking four times less rock per day than Navin will, you know, out of the mine. So that's down a lot. Like and there's no there's nobody spitting the community expect uh, except the, the protesters. The handful of protesters there is. And you know, we're happy to get on our neighbours. So there's really there's, there's no debate in the community, and if you look at it, you're on about recycling there. It, it takes four times more copper for an electric car than it does for an ordinary car. So there's no way the supply could be given up. There will have to be mining to take up that up till till quota was needed. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Councillor Ferguson was our next indicated councillor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Jerry, for coming and presenting. I know it's not an easy job, especially if you are telling us that you are being harassed for your opinions, and nobody should be harassed for their opinions, whether it's you know something that someone really is so passionate about. Um, I have met with Dalradian, and I, um, they have told me their their um, plans and and which they aren't going to use cyanide and how they're going to try and impact the environment as little as possible. I do have concerns because when questioned on the cyanide aspect of things, they couldn't definitively say that if they were to be bought out by a bigger uh, company that they would keep that policy in place. Um, I also have concerns around this mining of of uh, minerals because you know there are ways and means i know of one huge big <clears throat> tech company that does mobile phones and and they've built a robot which have, have basically they've gone to every uh dump that they've ever had and taken every bit of computer uh ipads and and iphones and, and they've put it through this robot and got all the gold and copper back from 
the the old stuff that we we never use anymore so they don't ever need to mine again so i think there's there's ways and means that we can look forward to the future and 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 see how we don't impact on the the environment anymore for our own consumer um technology i do agree with you i think knowledge is power and i have no problem at all meeting with david and again i have no problem at all looking at other minds to, to expand our knowledge on this one and i think a public inquiry will be a good thing because then everybody can see clearly all the facts and figures because these are in a very contentious area where you know there are big claims on both sides of of the argument i would like to know from you jerry just you You've said you're the silent majority and, and that there is um, only a handful of protesters. And I, I'm, I'm really sorry that she's are being harassed. But I wanted to know kind of what figures you would have for membership or any petitions you have done or anything signature wise. I know that people will want to protect their identity if, you, if you're saying that they, they are being harassed, you know. Um, but just wanted to kind of ask you how many people do you, do you have that are part of your membership, you know, are in support of it? I know a lot would be family members or people who work within the mine. Well, sorry, I've met people who've worked in the mine and themselves are supportive of it. Um, but no, uh, I think there's definitely more to be done. I would rather have an entire assessment, even the environmental impact, before you even approve any planning, because I think we need to weigh the, the future of our this outstanding area before, you know, our need right now for things like electric cars, but I really do appreciate you coming. Um, it's not easy to do and put your head above the parapet, um, but thank you. No problem, thank you. Well, well, in the rough estimate, two to four hundred supporters, hopefully not in the local area, like with many more quietly supporting in the background that doesn't just doesn't want to say nothing, wants to keep the head down, you know. So that's you know that's the way it is. But you're still on about you know. I, all electric needs metals, the, you know, power stations, every, uh, the metals is needed. So they're going to have to be mined. It doesn't, you know, they have to be got. You know, renewable energy is the way forward, but it's going to take mining to get that renewable energy up and running. So it is. You know, matter what we, you know, you know windmills the same. You know, the windmills, they all need, they all need, this, everything needed, copper, the whole lot's needed in them also. And you're not going to get you're not going to get away with that. Like if you take it there, solar panels on a house. There's more when copper and different stuff on those those solar panels than anything else. So those are needed also. Thanks, Slide. Our next undicated speaker is Councillor Tierney. Chair, sure, thank you, uh, and Jerry, thanks very much um, for your for your presentation. And I suppose. Um, at the outset, I would like to say that, you know, if anyone is um, being intimidated because of, of their opinion, um, that that shouldn't be happening. Um, and I would totally uh, condemn uh, that harassment, I think was the word uh, that, that, that you actually used. Um, I think that's wrong um, and, and it shouldn't be happening. Um, everyone should have a, an equal opportunity um, to have their voice heard. Um, uh, and I think that's why it's important and, and why it's good to have um, a representative from uh, the silent majority um, address this council meeting today. Um, I have my own opinion on uh, what the, the outcome um, of this process um, may be um, and what the outcome may be um, for the wider uh, Greencastle area over uh, the next 25 years um, if this was to get um, approval. Chair, my comments really are around the, the potential proposal from Alderman Ramsey. And you'll forgive me because I don't have access to the chat box, and I'm unsure at this stage whether or not that has got a seconder. Um, but as I understood and tried to listen very carefully to what Alderman Ramsey was saying, and briefly, as I, and I, I appreciate that you've pulled it up there um, on, on the chat box for, for those of us that are in the chamber, um, my reading of it, uh, as I see it, states um, and it's really the second part, contact Northern Ireland Water to get the water quality regarding reading, sorry, for the past number of years um, in this particular area. Chair, is it appropriate for this council to be contacting Northern Ireland Water to be getting those readings? Or is that the job of the public inquiry? Um, because as I see it at the moment, 
there's only one outcome for those um, results. They will be put on the paper um, that will be read by this committee. We can't actually do anything for it. And those councillors or aldermen who are currently in support of this process and this application um, will use the outcome of that uh, report, if it suits them, to say that this should be allowed to go ahead. And those who aren't, um, if it suits them, will we'll use it as well. And it will only be used in an argument within this chamber. There's no real reason, in my opinion, or maybe I'm reading the situation wrong, but as I understand it, there's no real reason for this council to be contacting um, NI Water to get these readings, other than so that councillors can use it in, in their side of the argument within this chamber. I think that's a job for the public inquiry. Um, I welcome the fact that there's going to be a public inquiry, and I would encourage anyone um, within the local area or anyone who wants to feed on it um, to feed on it um, if they possibly can. But I think in terms of um, strategic partners um, around this council area, um, Northern Ireland Water being one of them, I believe that the public inquiry should speak to Northern Ireland Water and should take evidence from Northern Ireland Water. And I don't understand the value of this council contacting Northern Ireland Water to ask for those uh, readings um, of the water of the, for the water readings in that area. Um, and I have a genuine fear that before that we might be getting involved in sticky water, pardon the pun, sticky water, where it's the job of the public inquiry to do, not the job of this council. And before we take that proposal, Chair, I would like to, to find out from officers, and I appreciate that there's no legal officer here, but but I would like to get a to get a legal sounding on that before we take that proposal, because I certainly don't want to be getting under the realms of interfering with a public inquiry um, if that's the road that we're going down. So before we we take a vote on this proposal from Alderman Ramsey, can we uh, get that opinion? Because I think it's important that we do that before we vote. Thank you very much. Councillor Tierney, I'm just conscious that uh, we don't have our legal representative here. However, I would invite uh, comments from Connor um, to see what he would have to say about it. I mean, um, just minded that we're still awaiting uh, water or a contact back from NI Water regarding tests for Mobile that have never been forthcoming. So. Sorry, yeah. Chair, can I come on about being my proposal and the last comments? I think I should have a right to reply to that. Yeah, uh, very briefly. And, uh, just, yeah, just, for, just to say, the reason, the, the the, reason uh, that this does, the reason sorry, that this I'm just, is, sorry. I'm just saying, and uh, for Councillor Tierney's information, that proposal has been seconded by Alderman Devaney. Go ahead, Councillor Ramsey. Sorry, just, uh, just for clarity. Um, we have a we have a duty uh, to to uh, to our repairs uh, to let them know the facts. Um, there has been uh, mention at uh, meetings in the past that Dalradian are poisoning the rivers, polluting the rivers. So this proposal that I'm making is so that this council, corporate, can ask and find out what the readings are on the water quality in that area because the rate pair needs to know the truth. That's simple as that. No other reason. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Um, Honor, would you like to come on this stage? Yeah, Chair, sure. and thanks for that. Um, subject to getting legal clarification, I don't think there's any restriction on the Council seeking the information, but as, as, as Councillor Tierney has said, it's for what purpose and what use beyond that. I think any um, output in terms of the water quality are something that the public inquiry would properly consider at a point in time. But I say I don't think there's any impediment to Council writing and requesting the information from NI Water as they've done for other um, water sources. Thanks, yeah, Chair, um, and, and, and thanks, Connor, for, for, for that response. I I may not have explained my point correctly, um, and, and I apologize for that. Um, I fully appreciate that there's, there's uh, nothing to stop Council from writing the NI Water, if that's the will of this committee, and then obviously a full Council at the end of the month, if that's where, where it comes. My point is that whilst I appreciate we can write, um, by writing and getting that information, is this council getting in the way of the job of the public inquiry? I, 
that's the question. You know, it's not about whether we, we should or we can. I appreciate that we can do that, but it's what is the outcome of that action um, further on down the road is the question that I'm asking. Chair, it may be useful then to um, defer the decision on this until we get the legal opinion and can be considered at a full council at the end of the month. Hmm. Alderman, would you be happy enough for that course of action? Legal opinion will be, as it has been a number of times before, that we are sending a letter seeking information, so um, there will be no legal issue with uh, reassuring and finding the truth for our, our uh, ratepayers and electorate. Thank you. Yes, Alderman, but uh, that didn't really answer my question in terms of uh, are you content that we uh, wait for I have, no issue, I have no issue wasting. I know it's going to waste time, but I have no issue uh, holding off till we get a firm legal opinion. Thank you. Chair, through you, just to point out, um, it's actually not going to waste time because even if we agree today, the letter can't be written until it's ratified at full council. So regardless of whether we we agree it today or we agree to full council, it's not wasting time. Um, it still can't be actioned. Okay, members, well, we've come to an agreement there that uh, we'll, we'll defer this proposal until we uh, get the input from our city solicitor. So we'll move on to our next speaker, which is Alderman Hussey. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Chair. And Jerry, uh, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you for your presentation. Um, and it would have been nice if uh, the young student had been alongside you just to, to, to have that point of view rather than just the words on the screen. Uh, because it's always good to hear from young people who are seeking to progress in society. Uh, personally, I, I regret that uh, some of the uh, comments that have been made uh, to yourself would actually have been better made to Dalradian because there were questions there, you know, that Dal Dalradian uh, should be should be answering. And you, of course, are speaking for a different point of view uh, than others have spoken to council on before. Um, I, I have to say on a personal level that the cyanide issue did concern me extremely deeply at the beginning. And like yourself, I, I, I do note that it appears uh, that Del Rodin have removed that particular process at this moment in time uh, from the processing of, of materials. Uh, with regard to the, the processing of materials, um, you know, you just don't dig raw gold out of the ground. It comes out in rock. It, it has to be processed and extracted. And the slag materials are left. Now, at the moment, my understanding is the extracted material is taken away and processed somewhere else. Uh, and I think the intention will be processing on site. Um, so have you had any indication as to how that will impact? Because there will be the equivalent, I suppose, of the old coal mining slags, there will be materials uh, that have to be dealt with that, that are residue. Uh, and I'm of that generation that vividly remembers the Aberfan uh, disaster in Wales, uh, because my, my late father was from Wales, and I remember that that slipping slag, uh, et cetera, and engulfing the village. Uh, and I mean, that, that's the image that, that, that people have. And again, maybe I'm guilty of uh, doing something that others have done and asking a question of you <laughs> that should be asked of Del Rodin. So it maybe is good that the proposal is uh, suggesting that we go on site again and meet with Del Rodin. Uh, but th there's that issue. Uh, the question was asked also, I think it was Councillor O'Neill, what would you rather see uh, in the place of, of the mine? And looking at the figures that you stood at there, you, you're looking at about 1,000 jobs, uh, 400 on site and 600 off site. I suppose, you know, from uh, an environmentalist point of view, the, the electric vehicles are, are the thing that are going to assist uh, with environmental issues. Uh, and, and I wonder how uh, Councillor O'Neill would feel if uh, if there was a factory going in the same location uh, to build electric cars and employing a thousand people. 
uh, that would have a significant and extreme, in fact, I would suggest a, a bigger significant footprint in the area. So, you know, the question surprised me, but um, the comparison in the two photographs, uh, and you look at them, there isn't, there isn't much difference. But if production goes to full scale uh, as, as is wanted, uh, there would be an increased footprint on the surface. Uh, and what are the thoughts of your group with regard to that? And finally, um, like others, uh, I'm aware of the public inquiry and I welcome the public inquiry. Uh, and I think that that's where the experts are. You know, we're not experts. Uh, I think we, we should let the evidence be given from whatever source to, to the experts and let them be the judgmental end of this. Uh, what is your attitude to the public inquiry uh, as we move towards that? Uh, but as I say, Jerry, thanks for, for your appearance and, you know, Good, good wishes to any community, any group that wishes to represent views in the community, whether people agree with them or don't agree with them. And like others have said, I'm I, I perturbed to hear that you would have faced harassment and nobody should face harassment for uh, expressing the views that are coming from their own community. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Well, you're, you're on about the Aberthorn. That was terrible, but that was in the 1960s. We don't drive 1960s cars anymore. Everything has moved on. Like everything's more modern. Dalridian is a modern company. Like and everything's changed. You go back. There was, there was no such thing as health and safety then. Now, <coughs> health and safety is the main priority in any any business. You know, so that's why we would have no concerns. But the public inquiry is the main one. If we can get the public inquiry called, we are happy whatever the outcome is. From the public inquiry, you know, whether it goes, whether it goes ahead or it doesn't go ahead, whatever comes out of it, we are happy. You know. Can't uh, Alderman Hosey? As I, as I said, I mean, Jerry has come along and, and expressed quite a few things there, but many of our questions are questions that should be with Dalrydian. Uh, and I, I acknowledge uh, and, and the, uh, the issue that there are other voices, and I'm glad that we're hearing them. Uh, there are other voices there whereby those that we have heard up until now, and it's good to hear those other voices. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Alderman. I have uh, Councillor Donnelly next, and then Alderman Devaney. Good chair. Uh, I'm not a member of this committee, but thanks for allowing me to, uh, to speak here. All right, Jerry, and uh, thanks for your presentation. Unfortunately, a bit of IT problems here, so I kept cutting in and out. Uh, I got some of it. So, but look, but my, my, you know, and I'm not going to rehearse some of the the the, the arguments that you know we've heard the arguments for and against. But it just, I think somebody said that it takes fifteen hundred tons of rocks to get three point five m. I'm not sure exactly what that is, ounces of gold. And, you know, regarding gold, there's believed to be thousands, hundreds of thousands of tons already uh, existing in the world, extracted worldwide. And the vast majority of this still exists because it's been described as it's indestructible. You know, is there a need to, to extract this gold? And you know how much of the, the the profits from this gold will actually go to the local infrastructure? Will go to hospitals? They will go for roads or, or local communities? Because the perception is is that you know the people behind Dalradian are greedy investors, pension funds. You know, uh, uh, and there's just a concern. You know that that you know I believe resources of Ireland should go to the people of Ireland. How much of this? Is actually going to benefit the local community rather than greedy uh, investors. Thank you. Well, you know, every shop of this has been a gold mine. This is more than a gold mine. You have silver, you have copper as well. It's just not a gold mine. There's more metals than one, you know, and most, as I say again, metals is needed for renewable energy. But you're on about money. That's a question for Dalradian. That's not a question for me. I can't answer questions like that, you know. But, the tar mines, as one 
the profit, the local area, the money is for that lot. You know, that's all you've got. Thanks, Jerry. Um, as you say, I suppose maybe Councillor Donnelly, you know, that, that question is probably better suited to that already. And I can't, you know, you couldn't expect uh, Jerry to have those exact figures there, but I'm not sure if you're satisfied with that answer or not. So, you know, I, I just thought that there's somebody they were sort of championing that. I hope that's not the wrong word for you, Jerry. You know, would have some type of homework on 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 where that the dough goes. You know, we're going to do all this. Uh, you know, as I say, 1,500 tons of rock extracted every day for several ounces of gold. You know, we'd like to know what's it all about. But uh, thanks, Jerry. Anyway. Okay, thank you, Councillor Donnelly. And our final indicated speaker that, that I have here is, is uh, Alderman Devaney, and I just see Councillor Kelly has indicated there as well. So go ahead, Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in, and I welcome Jerry um, uh, on the presentation. And I know the whole issue is in around gold today. Uh, and you know, when you look at some of the gold watches uh, that I see, the the most some of the most expensive ones are around two hundred and fifty, three hundred thousand for a watch. Um, but I have to say, um, uh, you know, Alderman Hussey talking about Aberfan, I remember. So both of us are giving away our age, Jerry, when we're going back to those days black and white televisions there i say and, and i just want to say and i know the issue uh, is probably going to be deferred to the the full council meeting regarding the the writing to northern ireland water and i think it's, it was important that, that it's important that we do write to northern ireland water and we reassure the residents in that area and local area the residents that the water is clean and fit for purpose and fit for use um there has been a lot of um, fours uh, and against here, and I appreciate that. And Jerry, I want to put on record that, that our party condemns any um, bully tactics should it be through intimidation or harassment. We totally condemn that. And look, I'm not going to rehearse everything that everybody has said, Jerry, because I think Alderman Hussey hit the nail on the head. There are a lot of questions being asked here today, uh, and you know. Dan Ridian are the right people with the facts and figures uh, and whatever it is that we want to ask. So, Chair, I am going to make a, a proposal um, that we invite Dan Ridian back in to an ER meeting that this committee can scrutinise them and ask the questions. Because I, I do think it's unfair uh, asking Jerry questions here. And look, if we had Dan Ridian here, we could go into more detail and we could get more detailed answers. And I'm not saying, Jerry, you haven't done a good job. I'm not saying, but I would appreciate that already in them so we can drill in and they can give us the answers back, Chair. So I, I would make that a proposal, Chair, that look, and it's very simple, just we invite Dal and back in again to an ER meeting. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Alderman, if you could just put the, that proposal under the chat box while uh, uh, Councillor Kelly addresses the committee. Go ahead, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks to Jerry uh, on behalf of Asylum Majority for the presentation. I don't have any questions other than on some of the points that were previously raised by members. Um, I suppose we, we have um, differing and, and maybe overlapping interests and, 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 and concerns in relation to uh, the proposal from Dalradian. I suppose one of the things that uh, I can certainly agree with him on uh, fully and fun fundamentally is uh, the uh, public inquiry and the need for the public inquiry and that's where all of these issues will be uh, examined in the cold light of day and the, the emotional and the high emotion sometimes around uh, a lot of these issues is kind of uh, is, is killed off and we start to look at some of the detail in and, uh, in and of itself and, and and devoid of that emotion and we can we can get to the nitty gritty of it and i think that's something that we do agree on and i appreciate appreciate him taking the time to come to the committee today thank you Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Members, I have no further indicated speakers. Um, so what I tend to do now is to pick uh, Alderman Devaney's proposal, which has been seconded by Alderman Ramsey. Members content that we invite Dalradian back in to an address environment regeneration meeting. I'm not hearing any. 
not hearing any dissenting voices, members. So I'm going to just take that proposal as as carried. Right, Councillor Jackson. Chair, yeah, and just just picking up on the, the previous point there from Councillor Kelly when he referred to the public inquiry and the the fact that the public inquiry is a place for those discussions to be taking place, devoid of the the motions um, that's that are running high on in respect to this issue. So um, I don't believe that it would be beneficial um, at, at this point in time in the mouth of it at a public inquiry to invite already and under the committee and because it's just going to um, we're going to rehearse the discussions that should that should be taking place um, during a public inquiry. So um, we won't we won't be supporting the proposal that's in front of us. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. With that in mind, then I will have to uh, put the proposal to the floor. So I'd ask Connor to do that, please. <clears throat> okay, Chair. Thanks for that. Um, I'll go through the list, and uh, members can um, advise if they're for or against the proposal. So, Alderman Devaney. For. Alderman Hussey. For. Alderman Kerrigan. For. Alderman Ramsey. For. Uh, Councillor Boyd. Against. Councillor Dobbins. Against Connor. Councillor Edwards. Against Connor. Sorry, did you say again? Against Connor. Yep. Yeah, got the Councillor Ferguson. For Connor. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Against. Councillor Kelly. Against. Councillor McGinley. Councillor McGinley. Councillor McHugh. Yes. Councillor O'Neill. Yes. And Councillor Tierney. Councillor Ramsey, you wish to raise a point of order? Yeah. Um, we don't have a legal team here, I know, but uh, I was led to believe that proposals at these meetings now have to go forward to Council for uh, ratification to go through or not go through. Um, that we don't make, that we're not entitled basically to make a decision until full Council on motions. Councillor Ramsey, just for clarification, that is in relation to the reports from officers. The recommendations within the reports don't require a proposal, a proposer and seconder, unless, of course, there's a, an alternative view to the recommendation. But members are uh, free to make proposals at meetings, which will then go forward to full council for ratification anyway. Okay, so it's obvious the outcome of this here. So. Dalradian, uh, the people that have the issues are, are haven't got a chance now to challenge Dalradian on behalf of the local constituents. So, uh, to me, this is uh, it's just basically um, covering up um, uh, issues that people have. If we could let uh, Connor uh, relay the, the result of the, the vote. Thanks, Chair. Those uh, for the proposal, five. Those against, eight. Okay, members, so that, that proposal falls. Um, members, I have no further indicated speakers on this issue. So, uh, can, I, just... can I ask for some clarification just on the last comments? Uh, uh, Councillor Donnelly, apologies, I'm not a member, of, but, but it's just that, that last comment that, that things were being covered up. It leaves it hanging on the air that there's somebody has done something wrong here. You know, a, a cover up, I think, is 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 a bit strong. Could could maybe uh, the alderman explain what he means by covering up, or just for clarification, sure. Councillor Ramsey. 
no clear any response people, for it's it. quite obvious that there's issues and people are looking to question Dalradian which stuff that like obviously this group couldn't answer today we, we have a proposal went forward there to ask Dalradian to come on to answer them questions and uh, the councillors here today have just actually refused to allow that happen that doesn't sound like democracy to me thank you Alderman Ramsey, just remind you that there is public inquiry that's going to be taking place. That and any queries or or questions will, will of course be be explored by the public inquiry. So we'll not try and do the business of the public inquiry until that happens. So members, um, what remains for me to do now is chair of the committee is to to thank uh, Jerry for coming in again. Uh, obviously, the council have debated this issue many uh, many a time. And we have a corporate position on it, and indeed we support the calls for full public inquiry. Um, but that doesn't stop us here, and obviously alternative views as part of the democratic process. Um, so, Jerry, I'd just like to, to wish you well in your endeavours, and thank you again for for presenting to the, the committee. Um, I would ask you now if you could just log yourself out from the meeting if you have no further comments. No, I'd just like to thank yourselves for giving me the time to do it. But tonight, uh, so please will take it on board. Thank you. Thanks. Just wait a minute, folks, until uh, make sure Jerry is logged out. Okay, members, um, we're moving on now to our next item. Uh, I propose that we take. Uh, We've already dealt with matters arising prior to our presentation. So eight and nine, I think Frank's taken those together regarding street naming and property number. So go ahead, Frank. Okay. Um, so item eight uh, is to inform members of the outcome of recent application. Uh, so proposed by Councillor Tierney. And seconded Chair, by Chair, Councillor Jackson. Chair, Chair John Boyle here, can I roll us back a bit? There was an item seven there, I think, might have needed to dealt with, or maybe I'm wrong. No, we dealt with item seven prior to the the, uh, the presentation because uh, he was having difficulty logging in, so we dealt with item seven then, uh, Councillor Boyle. Just sure, we're... Thanks for clarity, thanks. No problem. Members, item eight and nine, the recommendation um, an officer's report has been and seconded, or I don't see anybody uh, against it, so I'll take them as. Uh, Chair, I, I've put a, a thing in the chat box there, Chair Alderman Kerrigan here. Councillor Kerrigan, go ahead, just seen it there. Oh, sorry, Chair, sorry. Uh, just, just a point of clarification, Chair, uh, in regards to, uh, in regards to, to item eight, uh, I'm just seeking clarification as to what, what does Council use in regards to getting the sorry trying to get in across the screens here item eight there and i see that the five uh, areas uh, the five roads or parks which are mentioned and it's stating um street road the name and then the and the table there on page 28 of the pack and it names the number of addresses included in the survey then we have the addresses who returned the survey form and uh, eligible occupiers and the percentages chair i'm seeking clarification as to what uh w the number of addresses included in the survey and how does council come up with that because um i have taken a wee look there and uh, there are five streets and roads mentioned there and three of them are incorrect according to my figures um as far as i can see now, again, I'm not 100% familiar with it, but Blackthorn Manor, it states there's 100 addresses. From my information, there's 102. Um, again, Pulley Iron and Road, uh, that states there are 23 addresses. From my information, there are 21. And Scrahey Road, uh, it states that there are 28 addresses. And from my knowledge, I'm not going for information, my knowledge, there are 30. So I would contend that these figures aren't right. So I wouldn't be content on the current process. I have checked with the uh, Department of Finance, the uh, rates office, if you want to call it that, and regards the number of addresses which are um, rate payable, paying rates are on the rate register. 
and those would be the figures that they would be working with. And I'm just wondering, are we working off a different system or why, as I say on this check here, are we out on three out of the five? So I'm not, as I say, just if I can get a bit of clarification, because at the minute I wouldn't be prepared to support it because I don't think it's right. Okay. Um, uh, I will check that there with the officer who undertakes the, these uh, work. But to the best of my knowledge, I would assume that he's using the pointer system for post, uh, that is the definitive record for postal numbers um, uh, used across uh, public government. So, uh, I, but I will get that confirmed by him and I'll bring in uh, an item into next month's uh, meeting just to clarify that point for you. That, that that's that's grand, but chair, it's it's up to yourself, chair. But uh, what you're thinking the, the situation is, but I would be content to let it sit because I'm just not content that they're they're that they're right. As I say, that's all it is. It's more the figures that the number of people that have been contacted, you know. So as I said, I don't know which ones have been have been contacted and haven't. So as I say, just for clarification, there, chair, I'm just not content with it at present. Okay, Councillor Kerrigan, um, but Council has a policy um, in place and uh, presumably the policy has been followed by the officers and this is the outcome of the plebiscite. So uh, the officer, officer's recommendation is in front of us, has been proposed and seconded. So, I mean, if I can put it to a vote. Uh, Chair, Chair, probably put it to a vote because I, I'm not content enough to support it. So I'm going to have to go against it at that stage, Chair, if you don't mind. Thank you. Okay, the last corner. Yeah, I'm happy if he wants to wait to get the, the information. If we can get even that back, maybe Frank could bring that back for full council and we'll do it then. Possibly. Okay. If that's an option. Okay, are members content with that course of action? That we delay it until the full council so that Councillor Kerrigan can be uh, given the information? I'm content if that's okay, Chair, if it's in order. It'd be ratified at full council anyway, Chair. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Ferguson. I was just saying, yep, I'm content with that also. And Councillor Dobbins. You're content as well. Okay, members. Derek, you're content as well. I think uh, that's unanimous. So uh, our next item then is the proposed Stabane Town Centre commercial facade painting scheme. Uh, Tony, who's taking this? Go ahead, Tony. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, members, um, this is the update, Jim, the, the current work to secure external funding to support the delivery of a, com a commercial facade painting scheme um, and identify streets in Strabane Town Centre. You'll note, uh, members, um, that um, Council has just recently completed the delivery of a revitalisation shop from Handsome Scheme from um, within the Church Street and Butcher Street areas in Strabane Town Centre. A total of 18 commercial properties have been targeted in that scheme, um, and we secured £217,000 to deliver the scheme, um, and works to 16 and 18 properties are complete, uh, with the remaining properties to complete now by the end of uh, next month. Um, officers are keen to continue to identify new funding opportunities to support further commercial property facade improvements in the Town Centre. Uh, and you'll note members' uh, previous reports to ENR from during the period 2016 to 18 of the need to focus um, the attention on the commercial facades along Derry Road and Market Street in particular, uh, some of which are in a poor state of physical appearance. Uh, members, uh, you'll be aware also that due to the uh, Strabane Town Centre Public Realm project, which is planned, that the DFC funding protocols are such that it's not possible at this uh, pre stage to support the full scale revitalization shop from enhancement uh, schemes. Uh, but notwithstanding that, officers are committed to identifying the potential uh, to deliver full scale revitalization uh, schemes in the areas where the public realm project is planned, but that would be at the post completion of the main public realm project itself. In the interim, however, uh, officers have identified the need to design a proposed scheme that will focus on the painting of eligible commercial facades along a linear route um, extending from both sides from Derry Road at its junction with Patrick Street and along to Market Street at its junction with the um, Main Street roundabout. Uh, members, you'll note that this stretch of Strabane Town Centre, there is a need for intervention by means of the delivery of a painting scheme to address some of the properties which are in a poor state of appearance. 
the coordinated delivery of paint schemes um, can have a positive visual impact upon the character and appearance of such locations. Uh, and as such, they don't require uh, any formal statutory consents normally and can be delivered within relatively short timescales. Uh, accordingly, we've been liaising with our colleagues in DFC's Northwest Development Office and have submitted a formal funding application to, to deliver such a scheme. Um, the application is currently under consideration, and we hope to be in a position uh, following the outcome of the application to start uh, initiating um, business owners to property um, owner engagement. Uh, in addition to any procurement pr processes. It's important to highlight members that the application remains under consideration at this moment in time, and there's no confirmed funding in place. However, um, uh, should the application be successful, uh, then obviously um, we will have further detail in relation to the eligibility for inclusion, and also if there's any match funding requirements required from the participating properties. And as with all projects of this nature, like revitalization, they're delivered as one single project uh, by council through its uh, appointed contractors. So members turning just to the conclusion then, um, in terms of implications in section 4.2, uh, no funding has been confirmed as yet for the project, uh, although we do anticipate a decision in the coming weeks. Uh, there are no direct cost implications to council, uh, with the exception of there being uh, resource implications from officer time to design, uh, deliver, and manage the project. So, members, from a recommendation um, viewpoint, um, we're asking you to note the contents of the report and to authorize officers to progress with the implementation stages of this uh, commercial property facade painting scheme should funding be successful. Uh, thank you, members. Thanks for that, Tony. Um, good luck. Hopefully, it will be successful in terms of the bud, and no doubt there areas and towns and villages within the district that could avail of uh, similar schemes, which no doubt the indicated speakers are, are going to address now. So, uh, Alderman Hussey. <laughs> Do you want me to bother speaking after that introduction, Chair? <laughs> um, yes, uh, Chair. Uh, like you said, I, I welcome the scheme. Uh, it, uh, if it comes to fruition, it will be exactly very, very good for the urban centre that is Strabane. A uh, couple of questions with regard to the 217 for the properties uh, at, in paragraph 2.1, uh, the properties there, uh, was that matched funding, a matched funding type scheme as well, or was it 100% funding? Uh, Tony, you did refer there to uh, future schemes and uh, that there may be a matched a funding element within it. So, um, w was that original scheme uh, of the 217 received from DFC, uh, w was that 100% or was there a matched funding element in that? Uh, and uh, uh, the chair has anticipated where I would be coming from in that I would let, we, we would all, uh, uh, those of us who represent rural areas and settlements within the rural areas and indeed. Uh, Settlements with active main streets, active uh, shopping areas, uh, that we would like to see something similar uh, being developed. Now, I've been told in the past that um, DFC will only fund schemes in urban areas on this. Uh, I, I don't know if that still would be the case, but I would certainly want to make an amendment to the recommendations. Uh, whereby members are asked to note the contents of the report, authorise officers to progress with the implementation stages of the proposed commercial property facade painting scheme, uh, should funding be successful, and to investigate the expansion of this scheme to our rural set to businesses in our rural settlements. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Alderman Hussey. Are you looking back in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, and just to respond to the two questions, um, the scheme uh, that, that we've just delivered in Strabane Town Centre uh, was uh, offered grant rate at a rate of 100%. Um, now, since uh, that project was designed and, and actually submitted to the funder, uh, the, there has been a, a change to the uh, how such schemes are funded going forward, whereby uh, the funder 
uh, does look, now look for a contribution of 10 percent so uh, and we're seeing that already in the schemes that are under active design in Derry city center um, and it, and we believe that it will be uh, on the basis of the, the the revised approach from DFC and it, it's likely to be um, a, a 10 percent contribution from the um, from the building owners who are participating in the scheme and again consistent with those that are currently being managed and 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 designed actively here in Derry City Centre. In relation to the second point um, that Alderman Hussey has identified, just to, I suppose, to advise him that we are actively engaging with um, government departments in relation to that particular uh, point uh, with the view to um, establishing the potential for similar schemes, you know, that, that could potentially be run out, uh, uh, you know, outside of the major towns and cities. Um, uh, which DSE currently support. So again, that is very much um, I suppose, a, a live conversation at this moment in time. Uh, and obviously, we will keep members appraised uh, of the outcome of that in due course. Thank you. Uh, Chair, if I can come back very briefly, uh, thank Tony for, for the response reference to the match funding. Uh, and 10% isn't bad compared to schemes of years ago, which were uh, many of them perhaps on a 50-50 basis and some smaller than 40% actually uh, with 60% from the business. Uh, and I welcome what Tony has said of the ongoing uh, efforts to expand the scheme. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Thanks for letting me in. And just on the on the report overall, I do welcome the work in Strabane and, and Church Street and Chapel Street, and, and I think it will be positive to extend them to the, I think to Dairy Road and Market Street um, on the on the report. Um, it, it is, um, and I know the public realm scheme. Uh, I know it's stalled, but th those streets are in a bad condition. Um, they're in a very bad condition, and I know I've rehearsed as of others time again um, that we're disappointed in the public strabane public realm scheme stalling. And I would first like to get an update on where we are with that and where, whether we have a definitive uh, time frame. I know that the Minister for Communities um, and her last update in the Assembly <coughs> didn't give as much as, as a commitment as I would like um, for, for Strabane Public Realm. So I would just like to know, uh, is it still a scheme that's, that's going ahead or, or where are we with it? Um, and again, those businesses um, are waiting on uh, the public uh, realm works. Um, including work under the shop frontages there. Um, so they were waiting on that scheme to happen in Straban Town. And just on the second point, completely agree with Alderman Hussey, and, and that was my initial thoughts as well about the rural uh, towns and villages. And I know, as Alderman Hussey would agree, Newton Stewart, Castle Rex, Mills, for example, could be do they're doing with a similar um, scheme, especially um, after COVID and the pandemic the impact it's had on our rural economies. I think um, it would be very positive to have um a, a similar scheme uh to to do up basically the shop frontages and, and help those commercial premises out in, in our rural areas and i do welcome comments there for, uh, from the officer that um there's work currently go, going on looking into that um and I, I would like to be kept up to date as i believe alderman hussey said there on on where we are going with that but that's my comments there chair thank you thank you councillor edwards um connor is looking on here yeah, Chair, just to say that, that as Tony has mentioned, there, there are ongoing discussions with funders to try and um, source and bring additional funding into the rural area. And I think that we would be, um, you know, seeking a positive outcome in those discussions over the next number of weeks and months, and certainly we'll bring that back into members uh, by means of update. And I know that Frank has been um, actively engaged in Mr. Ban Public Realm, and can maybe update just on where that project sits today. Right. Yeah. Um, currently, the Strand Public Realm, the the design work's all complete, and the the uh, EA, the economic appraisal, had to be updated, and that sits with the department uh, to sign off on. There's been a bit of back and forth um, with them, um, just some queries, but at this stage, we're not aware of any further queries from the department. So uh, once their economists have uh, finished uh, reviewing it, it'll then go to the Department of Finance for their economists to sign off um, with a fair wind. Um, and assuming that there, um, there are no 
uh, hiccups with the, 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 the economic appraisals, then the hope is that uh, we we'll get the green light for funding in the next financial year, um, which with um, that was the case, then we would hope maybe to be able to have a contractor come into site uh, early next summer. Thanks for that, Frank. Um, I have uh, Councillor Tierney next. Chair, Chair, thank you. Um, it's just, a, I suppose, a quick question um, for Tony. Um, 3.1 um, of the report. Members will note that reports presented to you and our committee during the period of 2016 to 2018 of the need to focus attention on the pre present presentation of commercial facades along identified sections, and then it names the, the identified sections. As the officer confident um, that possibly five years on that these are still the, the main areas of need within Savannah Town Centre. Um, just a quick point really, you know, or will there be further consultation with the wider public in Strabane about where and business owners about where this should be or are we designating that this is the area and are we confident if it is the area that this is the area of most need of this work? Uh, thank you, Chair. And just to respond to that, um, obviously uh, from previous um, um, dialogue with committee, uh, we've always indicated the need for us to uh, identify streets which are in most decorative need. Back then, um, along th that stretch of Derry Road and Market Street, uh, there there is and so there was and there still is a high level of decorative need. And that that said, that's not to say that uh, other streets may may not. Uh, require intervention, but um, through um, our engagement last year as part of the COVID recovery revitalisation scheme and our engagement with the businesses, uh, there was very much a desire uh, last late last summer that the council turned its attention to looking at uh, that particular section of the street uh, for now. But that said, and I think it's important to say that the department have been very proactive and very constructive with this in terms of committing to carrying out these interim schemes now, but also identifying what are the next projects post delivery of the public realm project. So just to emphasize a commitment by officers to continue to um, to focus in on and identify funding opportunities to um, for both Strabane Town Centre and Derry City Centre and as Connor has alluded to, continuing to work with departments in relation to how we can extend those into the rural areas as well. Thank you. Thanks for that, Tony. And final indicated speaker is Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks to Tony for the uh, presentation on that report. Uh, a couple of queries just in relation to 2.1. Uh, it does mention Church Street and Chapel Street. I'm just um, maybe if that could be clarified because there is no Chapel Street in Strabane. Um, in terms of the uh, 217,000 from DFC, the fact that that's uh, well through in terms of the 16 of the 18 properties, I, I very much welcome that investment into the town centre. It's much needed. Uh, one of the things that I don't see in the report is uh, a list of the successful applicants. Uh, and I, I note that there's 18 businesses or properties that have benefited. And I was just wondering where they are. I'm not doubting that they're there, but it's it's hard to see 18 uh, business or commercial properties just uh, as you're walking around. Um, so I, I would appreciate if a paper come, could come back with a, a list of the successful applicants, just to kind of uh, finish out that chair. And, and, and just uh, picking up on the, the, the time frame um, uh, that Brian was referencing there, I, I agree. Uh, I know there's been a number of schemes that have been presented uh, over the last number of years, and for various reasons, um, most notably um, things around the, the layout of the, of the Strapan Square, Abercorn Square, um, the removal of the pagoda, the road layout, railway road, into um, uh, coming around into the back street. Uh, th th those proposals kind of fell by the wayside. Now that there's a general acceptance of a sort of a proposal going forward, I hope uh, we will see more progress uh, in the in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Tony, are you content to to furnish members with that information? Yeah, we'll bring it back. Okay. Members, um, are we content then with the recommendation with the addendum from Alder Van Hossey uh, to investigate the expansion of such a scheme to businesses in our rural settlements? 
um, members, I would take it that that would be unanimously accepted. So further indicated speakers. So I know you. Who's Chair, can I come in on that? Go ahead, Councillor Kelly. Yeah, will that be, is that proposal in association with DERA? Uh, just just to kind of to kind of pad it out a bit I, I think it would be it would save time i think if we were to kind of go across a, a sort of interdepartmental approach when we're kind of doing these uh, proposals rather than going to the department and then coming back and then going back and then eventually saying well actually no it's somewhere other department so i think if we just kind of bring forward a proposal which goes sort of forward inter interdepartmentally uh, there's a, a greater chance of success at an earlier stage Chair, if I can briefly come in there, uh, I totally concur uh, with Councillor Kelly on that. Uh, we need to investigate every avenue, and there has been this uh, issue in the past of you know uh, rural settlements. So is it DERA or is it DFC for this type of scheme? Uh, you know it is DFC, but you know we are communities, even though we are in the rural area. So all avenues should be investigated. Yeah. Um... Would recommend then that we investigate with all relevant funders the expansion of such a scheme to businesses in our real settlements. No problem with that. Alderman, Are you content with that, uh, Alderman Hosley? No, no problem at all, Chair. Welcome it, in fact. Okay. Councillor Kelly, would that be suffice to meet your needs? Great, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman. Okay, members. Um, take that as read then. Um, our next item then is the pollinator plan. Um, Christine Doherty is going to take that one for us with a short presentation. So go ahead, Christine. Thank you. Um, will I share on the screen or is it available? Uh, you can share it or Paul can share it, Christine. Okay, thanks. Paul would do it here with the, the IT officer. Yeah, if you could, that'd be great, thanks. Okay, no problem, just give us a minute. Thank you, Paul. Okay, good evening everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Christine Doherty. I'm Council's Biodiversity Officer and I'm the Lead Officer for the Dairy and Survival Green Infrastructure Plan. Um, could you move that off for me please, Paul? Um, so this evening I'm just going to outline the relevant background policies and legislation associated with the development and rationale for Council's Pollinator Plan. I'll outline the development of Council's Pollinator Plan, which is aligned to the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and was an action from the Jerry Strapan Green Infrastructure Plan. I'll also outline the key action from Council's Pollinator Plan, which everybody I'm sure is aware of by now, the Don't Won't Let It Grow project, which is to create habitats and sources of food to prevent biodiversity loss across the district. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? So this slide's really about the relevant policies and legislation associated with Council's Pollinator Plan. So to bring you back about a decade ago, in 2011, there was new legislation brought into Northern Ireland, which is the Wildlife and Natural Environment Act, which introduced a statutory biodiversity duty for all public bodies. And that was for all public bodies to further the conservation of biodiversity in all their functions and everything that they do. It was also, and part of that legislation, um, introduced for public bodies to have regard for the Northern Ireland Biodiversity Strategy. And so Council has been assisted in the delivery of the Northern Ireland Biodiversity Strategy. And we um, submitted a report there earlier in the year in terms of how we've been assisted in delivering that over the last decade. And also as well, in terms of how we're managing our state and ensuring that our functions meet this biodiversity duty over the last decade. And I suppose as part of that, recently we've developed the Dairy and Strabane Green Infrastructure Plan 2019 to 32, which is aligned to our community plan and local development plan. And it aims to proactively assist our partners 
to manage the district at a landscape scale and to ensure that our green and blue spaces are connected and resilient to prevent biodiversity loss and address climate change. And really managing large scale areas for habitats and species is often referred to as nature recovery networks and this allows the restoration of ecosystems at scale over the long term. And in terms of the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, uh, this provides actions and terms for different sectors across the island to address the potential extinction of a third of our pollinators or bee species and to prevent any further biodiversity loss. So by adopting this green infrastructure approach or landscape scale approach, we can use this pollinator plan to actually create nature recovery networks across the district and on a wider scale across the island of Ireland. And as opposed to looking at a more global um, and national scale, collectively the policies and legislation shown here um, can contribute towards the national UK government's policy in terms of nature positive by 2030, which is outlined later in the pack. Um, also as well at the global scale, um, these policies help to deliver um, the UN international agreements to address climate change and biodiversity loss. And I'm sure you heard in the news this week in terms of the COP15 um, to look at addressing biodiversity loss. If you can move to the next slide, please. So just to recap on green infrastructure, green infrastructure is an interconnected network of green and blue spaces, and this provides a range of environmental, economic and social functions. Um, and these range from green spaces, which we're all familiar with now, which is woodlands, parks, allotments or greenways, and water and blue um, spaces are, are water features, and these include things like lakes and locks and rivers and canals. So with the review of public administration in 2015, councils in Northern Ireland required a range of new duties, and these included the development of community plan and local development plan. So what we did was to use them structures to assist with developing better partnership working to address local issues. So with the development of the Green Infrastructure Plan, this assisted in the evidence base for the local development plan. And also as well, there was a number of key actions that are linked to this in terms of delivering the community plan. And in terms of the local development plan, we've actually embedded a lot of green infrastructure right throughout that document. And there is a lot of biodiversity policies and then a particular key one is biodiversity net gain as well. Uh, so just on the screen to recap the, the links with the Green Infrastructure Plan and um, the Local Development Plan, we have people in place, which is a key theme, and that really looks at things like our greenways, our public um, parks in terms of play facilities. It also looks at green and blue spaces, economic prosperity, looks at things like regeneration, tourism, jobs and skills. Um, so biodiversity is, and climate change are self-explanatory. And there's three cross cutting themes there, which are health and well-being, communication and engagement, and natural capital. And an action from the biodiversity key theme here um, of the Green Infrastructure Plan was to develop a council pollinator plant using a green infrastructure approach. So this is where this sits in terms strategically with these other plans. So we can move on to the next slide, please. So why are these um, pollinator plans and pollinators so important? Well, the, the key driver for Council's pollinator plan and the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, as I touched on earlier, is that 30 of the 99 bee species on the island of Ireland are at risk of extinction. Basically, there's one honeybee on the island, and it's a managed pollinator, so they're not actually at risk of extinction. There's 21 bumblebee species and 77 solitary bee species, and over 30 of these species are at risk of extinction. There are other insects that you can see on the screen there, for example, butterflies, moths, and wasps who visit flowers and conduct a small amount of pollination, but it's not that consistent and reliable. So it's really the bees that are doing all the work. And the main reason why these pollinators are at risk of extinction, one of the key things is we've changed our farming practices and also we have got rid of 97% of wildflower meadows. So we've lost basically summer for these bees to live and a source of their food. So the main thing is these bees are dying of hunger. There's not enough wires to support them, and there's not enough homes in terms of providing a nest and sites. So the key things are habitat loss and fragmentation. There's a smaller element in terms of invasive species, pesticides, and climate change, but the key thing is loss of habitat. So basically, we need to provide food and a safe place for them to live. Put simply, bees are like people. 
they need some to love and they need food to eat in order to survive. So we can move on to the next slide, please. Ecosystem services. So basically, this is the services that we as human beings receive for free from biodiversity. So our very survival depends upon them. Pollination is a really good example of an ecosystem service that we receive for free to create food and we need in order to survive. So basically, 71 of the top 100 crops that we rely on around the world is pollinated by animals. So basically, we need these animals to pollinate this food. Uh, or it's going to cost a lot more money. They pollinate things that we don't even we take for granted, things like apples, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, peppers, and tomatoes. So if we don't look after the bees, it's going to be reduced food choices and higher prices, similar to being experienced recently with Brexit and COVID. So to reverse this pollinator decline, the main drivers need to be addressed. So therefore, wildlife habitats need to be restored and these benefits need to be realised. So the key me mechanism to achieve this is through the implementation of the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. Move the next slide, please. So the All Ireland Pollinator Plan was launched in 2015, and it is coordinated by the National Biodiversity Centre in Waterford. And this plan aims to deliver practical action across a range of sectors. So that includes farmers, businesses, schools, um, and it really aims at declining. Uh, aims at looking at reversing that decline in pollinators, and they provided detailed how to action plans for all these sectors. The council provided a consultation response to this in 2015. Um, we had a few concerns in terms of the structure of the council pollinator plan because Northern Ireland local authorities are structured slightly different, and that we're not responsible for roads and water and things like that. So subsequently, whenever they revised the plan, we we adopted it. And we used the All Ireland Pollinator Plan um, action plan for councils um, as a guide on how we developed our own pollinator plan. So this was adopted by council, and we submitted a report last year to an Environment and Regeneration Committee outlining the delivery of council's pre previous pollinator plan to the same report Get the new slide, please. So there's a new All Ireland Pollinator Plan now running from 2021 to 2025. And we have developed Council's Pollinator Plan aligned to this, to the key relevant objective, objectives and actions listed in this. And the main one that's relevant to us is number two on the screen, which is to make public land pollinator friendly. And so we aim to do that by doing follow, uh, completing a range of actions on council owned green spaces up to 2025 um, in partnership with a range of our partners on the Green Infrastructure Plan. Um, and what we're looking to do is conserve pollinators on the island of Ireland and then at a regional level with our local authorities and um, adjacent local authorities um, and at a local level within the district. And so that we are looking to collectively on the island reverse this decline in pollinators. Um, the other objectives that are listed here um, of the All Island Pollinator Plan will be delivered by different sectors. So that's things like farmers and schools and businesses where they have their own dedicated plan. Um, and the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and the National uh, Biodiversity Centre in Waterford have a range of officers and they will be engaging with them different sectors on to encourage them sectors to change their land management for pollinators. Can you change the slide, please? So that basically sets the scene of why we have a pollinator plan and where we have taken these objectives and actions and how we fit in strategically to help deliver that at a district level. So basically, councils produce the new pollinator plan, which is in your pack, to bring back food and shelter for bees, which is aligned to the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. And our key objective is to increase the area of council land that is managed in a pollinator friendly way. So we are taking practical action to protect biodiversity by selecting large council owned public green spaces that have the capacity for at least a hectare of wildflower meadows so that we can create a balance of space for pollinators and space for people so that we have the ability to provide areas for informal kick around for football and picnics, but also as well, creating a source of food and a home for these bees. So it's creating a balance. So what we've done is we've created a network, green spaces, connecting these habitats, which provides food and shelter for a range of species. And you can see here on the map, which we have digitized onto our GIS system, 11 large green spaces that have had a change in grass management in 2021. And this is up one site from last year. 
when we had the pilot in 2020, where we had 10 green spaces. But we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, and so also this year, we've extended the programme to 23 cemeteries right across the district, and that provides um, a reduction in our grass management on 4% of our estate, which we are currently at capacity at, which is 30 hectares. So in layman's terms, what we've done is we've created 42 football pitches worth of wildflower meadows for bees at a landscape scale. So you can really see the distribution right across the map. And we also have been working in partnership to the north with Causeway Coast and Glens, to the east with Mid Ulster Council, and to the south with Vermont and Oma. And collectively, we've created 100 hectares of wildflower meadows um, on, on the northwest region for pollinators. Would you go to the next slide, please? So I'm sure by now you're familiar with the Don't Go Let It Grow um, campaign, and this is the signage that you'll see at our sites, and this is the tractor and the Amazon that we use to manage these spaces. So basically why we're doing this is that I always say cut grass is like a desert for bees. Basically they need food um, to survive and they need summer to live. I mean, if they're flying around on mowing grass, there's nothing to eat and they have to fly on somewhere else. And this is why the bees are at risk of extinction because they're dying of starvation. So what we're doing is creating wildflower meadows and we're actually using best practice example, which is to use the seeds that already are in soy, not planting them in wildflowers, seed, but using what's in the seed bank itself. And what we do is we allow that traditional approach of the, the, the seeds will grow, they'll flower and set their seed for the following year. And this creates a sustainable wildflower meadow. And this is a natural source of meadow rather than bringing in um, seed from that's not native from here, and the, and then bees are using that and pollinating that instead of the local flowers. So this is a key reason for us as well. And these other species might not survive um, to our local environment. Now we do sometimes receive a small number of complaints um, that the meadows may look unsightly towards the end of the season, and I just want to address that. So basically, as I touched on, the flowers need to grow have the flowering stage and then they set their seed. So towards the end of the summer, they may, by some people, think that that's on a, on a, sorry, doesn't look very well. And that's because we have to wait until that flower has set its seed for the following year. So for a couple of weeks, it may look like just long, rank grass. It's a really crucial stage in allowing us to have sustainable meadow for the following year so that the seeds are replenished into the ground so they can grow next year so that we don't have to purchase seed, um, which is not environmentally friendly. So that's a key reason. And it's just messaging that we just have to build on. But we, we do put that out into the, into the media. So that's a very key thing. And another thing is why we only cut the grass once or twice a year is that the majority of grasslands are actually cut too frequently and the grass is left behind. And what that does is actually stimulates and increase nutrient levels and vigorous grass growth. And that increases council's management costs. We have to cut that grass every two weeks and it's not necessary. Um, so we want to break that cycle in these meadows. And so by the change in grass management here, we're actually reducing the frequency of our cuts, reduces the vegetation growth. So we get an increase in more diverse flowering species. Um, and what that's going to do is provide a source of food for these pollinators. Um, so what happens is when the grasses are cut, these more diverse species can come through because they're not outcompeted by these grasses. So the key message is we just need to be more patient um, with some limited sites that can take a few years. Um, in the first year or two, you might not get the full diversity. And that's because we've had a lot of vigorous grass growth and we have to let that die back to allow other seeds to come through that maybe struggle to compete with these grasses. Um, and Council have really invested in this. We've actually purchased two of these Amazon special mowers. We traditionally cut and leave grass on site because it's logistically a lot easier and we have a lot of sites to manage. We do own 800 hectares, so we do own a lot of public land. Um, so what we've done is in some sites, we actually cut the sites um, in spring and in late summer and in other sites, depending on the need to reduce the grasses, we just cut once a year. So traditionally we cut grass 15 times a year. With this, it's just once and we cut and lift it with this Amazon mower. This is a more sustainable way of managing these 30 hectares. And we do, as I say, mark all these sites um, with signage saying, don't mow yet.
I just want to touch on additional benefits apart from pollinators with this change in grass management. Um, this new machinery has facilitated council to do. It's actually made significant cost savings for council in terms of being able to redeploy some staff during our busy summer season to do additional like ground maintenance activities. And I suppose another added bonus for us in terms of this is the reduction in grass cotton on these sites from 15 cuts to one or two cuts a year actually results in us saving two tonnes of carbon a year, which is significant when we're looking at how we're going to look at our services and reduce our carbon footprint. We can move on to the next slide, please. So these are just extracts of some of the types of actions that we'll be delivering, which are will assist with the delivery of the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. And what we're looking to do is create a pollinator trail on public land. Um, so we will be launching a campaign over the next month or two to engage with public accessible landowners to en en encourage them to sign up and manage their land for pollinators to form part of a pollinator trail. And this will be launched in the spring of next year. So that people can visit these public sites and see it as best practical examples for pollinators. And this map we will use, linking back to the start, in terms of the nature recovery networks across the district. So we get a really good understanding that we have created a, poll a pollinator friendly district, not just on our land, but on other uh, public land throughout the district, really trying to reverse that decline in pollinators. Um, we'll also be planting pollinator friendly trees in our landscape plans um, for new council developments. And, and a recent example of that is it's been included in our Ballon de Garde site. The All Iron Pollinator Plan um, have been working in partnership with DFI Roads and they've agreed on promoting pollinator friendly management across this road network and council will work in partnership with DFI to agree a minimum of three areas for pollinator friendly grassland management or white flower planting areas. Now, we are at capacity at the moment in terms of dealing with um, creating any more wildflower meadows. What we will do is create wildflower planting instead, and we are looking at options at that at the moment. We will pilot one site in 2022. We'll review it at the end of 2022 and determine from lessons learned to other sites um, suitable across the district for subsequent years. And that is to do with issues in terms of logistics, resources, and line of sight. So we've been very careful about how we will do that, but we will work in partnership with DFI on how to do that. Um, Council have adopted the Green Infrastructure Plan and Climate Adaptation Plan, um, and this has been incorporated um, into landscape planning and carbon reductions. And we are providing a lot of advice to other local authorities across the island who are coming to us and asking how we've developed our Green Infrastructure Plan and our Climate Adaptation Plan in terms of pollinators and how they can follow suit. Um, we've also done a lot of work in terms of natural capital, valuing the create of these meadows for pollinators from the don't mow let it grow sites and for the health and wellbeing benefits as we have 6.5 million visits to our council owned sites in the last year. Um, I also just let you know that we have surveyed all of our 11 large public spaces and the large cemeteries um, in terms of looking at how the flowers are doing and um, the pollinators are using them to make sure that what we are creating is actually effective in changing the grass management for pollinators and helping to deliver that reverse and the decline of pollinators. Can we change the slide, please? In terms of strategic coordination, we work very closely with the All Iron Pollinator Plan. Um, and what we're looking to do is um, we do a lot of initiatives in terms of raising awareness. We've created a section on a biodiversity section of our web page. We've created an eco zone page for schools and how they can get involved. We advise on pollinators um, through uh, media campaigns. We've done radio interviews, press releases, photo calls. Uh, we've installed signage, participated in a documentary about it. We've created an animation video on how you can create wildflower meadows in your own backyard in, so that we can create a number of um, locations so that to reduce the food hunger gaps across the district um, to use their own natural seed bank. Um, we've also engaged with consultants on large road infrastructure projects across the district to encourage them to do that with new schemes with our stakeholders, community groups, businesses, schools and sports clubs. We've done a lot and as I said, we've done a lot of knowledge exchange. We'll continue to do that and conduct further research into the benefits of changing our grass management for carbon storage of the soil in terms of the benefits of that versus traditional cutting grass. 
we, we've got a lot of um, research and working still to do on this, um, but we're really excited about it. I'm just going to move now on to the last slide just to give you a summary of how this all fits together. So council's pollinator plan at a local level really helps council deliver its biodiversity statutory duty to further the conservation of biodiversity and our functions. I suppose at a national level, it helps achieve the UK's government's policy on nature positive by 2030, which is no biodiversity loss. And on a global scale, it helps with the UN's international agreements to address biodiversity loss and climate change, which are known as the COP15 and COP26, which we hear about in the media. By adopting this green infrastructure approach, which is on a landscape scale, um, we can are going to create um, nature recovery networks across the district by contributing to the All Ireland Pollinator Plan to really reverse that decline in pollinators. It's a really good, simple, practical example of a green infrastructure project which delivers, as we've seen on the screen earlier, the key themes of biodiversity, climate change, public green spaces under the people, um, one of the food, health and wellbeing benefits, and it really shows how you can balance our green spaces by creating spaces for people and spaces for wildlife. There's a range of ecosystem services provided by this plan to include pollination of our local grown food, the health and wellbeing benefits for our residents, the carbon storage and fertility of the soil, and also reduction in our carbon emissions. An annual report will be submitted um, to the Environment and Regeneration Committee um, each December, outlining the delivery of the Don't Know Let It Grow project following the end of the grass cutting season. Just for you to be aware, we're not finished cutting grass at the moment, and we will outline in December's committee um, the results from that, from that work this year and the lessons learned. And a final report will be submitted to Council in December 2025, outlining the implementation of this five year pollinator plan. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Christine, for presenting to the committee today, and indeed thank you for uh, the work that you're involved in. And it's great to see some of that uh, within your presentation today. And indeed, it's very interesting to see the massive impact that something so small as a bee can have, and not only our planet but our, our day and day. Um, Councillor Duffy indicated and Alderman Hussey. So, Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Christine. That was a really enjoyable presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. It's great to see um, the progress that has been made in terms of the policies and stuff. And I really welcome the, the update that you have provided us with and, and then the update in the pollinator plan in itself and aligning it again with the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. Um, I have to say that the, the work that you have been involved in and that you have led in terms of council, um, making sure that the, the whole green infrastructure approach is incorporated and aligned right across um, the community plan has been, it, it's been great to watch and see the outcomes of that and see how it's progressing along. Um, in terms of the pollinator plan, I have to, I have to obviously welcome the fact that the collaboration is continuing with the dairy industry beekeepers um, they have also been doing amazing work, um, and I know in terms of the the apiary in Brook Park, they I mean that is I, I was visited over the the summer months there where they were opening it, and it the work that they have done to bring that up to a standard is great, and, and then they have the wildflower garden before you get into the the actual apiary part, so they're 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 doing amazing work and leading the way as well. Um, Christine, I have to, I have to just completely congratulate you on the Don't Mow Grow campaign that 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 was run, and you see that the presentation there in terms of the scale of it and the outcomes of it, that that just goes to prove the work that was going on. And I mean, in terms of myself and looking at it from a very small scale and going out for a walk and and, and seeing the beautiful wildflower meadows and particularly in, in the Bay Road where I where I walk the dog. It was it was something that I was very proud of to see that our council area was involved in and what they were doing around it. Um, but it also had that educational element to it where people were asking questions around why the grass wasn't being cut, um, why the, the you know, particularly as you alluded to there at the end, where the flowers maybe have died off and it, it looks like it's just long grass. But those really opened up conversations with, with the public. 
who contacted her sales maybe to, to get the grass cut or just even stopped us in the street to ask why why the grass wasn't being cut it opened up conversations where people felt that once they, it was explained out to them, they really got it and understood um, the, the significance of it and the whole um, environmental impact of just that one small act of not not cutting your grass. Um, so, no, it's been great for me to see that the, the work continuing. Um, and congratulations as well. You, you alluded to it in terms of the, the Plan B um, documentary that you were involved in. That really highlighted it, and uh, I know I spoke to you personally on it. But congratulations on that. The work that we're we're doing here locally, and uh, being led by yourself, Christine, in terms of that whole green infrastructure, and um, doing our utmost to preserve our environment for future generations, and then the protection of um our pollinators. It's it's key, and I I am really proud to be part of a council that's leading the way in it. So congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Um, Alderman Hussey. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Christine. Uh, certainly elements in this that, that I, I welcome with open arms. Uh, other members of Council have heard me uh, in the past urging that we should have cooperation with other public bodies like the FA roads and, in fact, th those pollinator corridors that are available uh, along stretches of many of our public roads. Uh, and the overall concept is absolutely brilliant and extremely welcome. Uh, can I ask Christine just one question uh, before I move on? The last picture of the meadow, where was that? So that was Drama Hole. That was the first year that um, we trialed it there. We extended it to Drama Hole, um, and it it was a site that actually received a few complaints. It always does on the first year. In terms of the change, and um, we had about so species a wildflower meadow is nine species per square meter, so that had about five, and um, so it was actually quite good for the first year. And hopefully, with the reduction in vigorous grass growth, that will increase next year. And um, now we can stimulate that if we don't, after two or three years, get a full floral display. We can a uh, plant um, wildflower meadow seed, but we prefer not to. We prefer to use. What's locally available in there so that the bees can pollinate the local stuff rather than potentially plant the stuff that's been growing up along the east coast of Northern Ireland. So that, that's from a whole park. Right, that, that's good. I appreciate that. Uh, it, it looked something similar to a photograph I'd seen of an area of the city cemetery, uh, which was open and expansive like that. Uh, but I do have a concern, and officers are aware of my concerns on this, with regard to uh, some of the cemeteries uh, where I, ha I have had uh, concerns to the point of uh, anger uh, that at the, you know, the, at the pollinator plan and how it's being carried out within cemeteries. Uh, some who would you know regularly visit uh, family members who are there, not necessarily living in this council area, but coming uh, to their to their family home area and wanting to visit the the graves of relatives, etc. Um, and find it very disrespectful. Uh, so I, I would hope that uh, in a review of uh, this first year th that we would look at that again. Um, I, I understand where we're coming from, uh, but at the same time, when my time comes <laughs> and I'm laid to rest in, in the local council cemetery, uh, I would like to think that uh, the area where I, where I am laid uh, would be kept in a tidy and uh, appropriate manner. Uh, and some people feel that the pollinator plan uh, took away from that. So I, I would hope that as you review going forward, there will be some extra thought given, particularly uh, to how we deal with this plan within our cemeteries. And I mean, I, I know that in some cases we're talking about cemeteries that are in inverted commas closed, but they are not closed to those who wish to visit. And, and we also must remember those who come from the likes of America doing the, the ancestral tracing stuff. 
and, and they want to go in, and to go in and see uh, a graveyard in what seems to be a state of unkempt, uh, of an unkempt nature and uncared for is not a very good picture to have uh, also. So perhaps that's something that can be thought about as we move into uh, future years of the plan. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Alderman. And our next speaker is Alderman Kerrigan. Allowing me in. And, and do welcome the report. And I know there's a lot of work that's been done that. And again, would have been very keen on, on you know, the, the wildfire seeds and that, you know, and getting young people and, and encouraged them to uh, use them and planting them for the bees. Because, I mean, it is such a such an important issue and, I, and you've touched on to the report and it definitely is first class um and you know the work i know there's still a lot of work to do but there's there's a lot of work that has been done again to be fair alderman hussey has touched on it you, you know uh, in regards to some of the cemeteries and i was just seeking clarification i think it is the case there that on that image there the the uh <clears throat> the image of the full council area um it's just it doesn't um uh, when you try to zoom in it doesn't it isn't as clear but that one with all the green dots on it, that's all cemeteries, as far as I'm aware. Yes, I. That's that's what I was, I, I, I was thinking that, but I wasn't just sure of the, some of the cemeteries further down, closer to the city and all that. I wouldn't have just been as uh, uh, as okay in them. But uh, exactly, when you are talking about some of the cemeteries, particularly some of the older ones, particularly, say, Mahrakeel or, or the Arch Thrall one or Scarva Heron and those ones there, uh, uh, you know... <laughs> They're older cemeteries. They're not really used uh, as, and and you know they can look a bit unkempt themselves and a wee bit wild themselves, and looks you know sometimes they can be a wee bit overgrown there. And I, again, had similar issues with that, you know. But I understand what's what's trying to be done. Um, just seeking clarification as well. There's um, you know, you have the map there, really of the city, and and with eleven areas you're stating there. I take it you know effectively then council doesn't really own any any suitable other areas outside of the city or have you investigated that to see is there a suitable area i know you've mentioned a hectare of ground we're chatting to have a, to a now language two and a half acres or 2.47 acres a ground effectively is what the size of plots you're looking for and it's a right lump of ground when you're talking about that but i'm just wondering you have looked and i think it maybe there isn't anywhere suitable across the rest of it in the ban or in the or the derg area or whatever and um again the other sorry i'm just having to switch screens here i'm not doing it correctly the the uh i suppose it, it is it's good to see that and again the as has been mentioned in regards to the, the side of roads i do notice there but i suppose we must be coming to an end of it now a lot of cotton I mean, a, a serious amount of cutting taking place on cider roads, and particularly in Fermanoma. Yeah, you, you know, recently, uh, you know, to put our council area to shame, but I know that's that whether that's just the EFI roads, but a serious amount of cutting been done. You'd remark it on the Drunkwan Road uh, and on further up. But, um, sorry, Chair, uh, Chair uh, Christine, where I was, was going to touch upon there, I, I understand in regards to, you know, we, we do, we are touching upon point two there which was what we could do as a council in regards to, sorry, making public land pollinator friendly. And I know we're touching upon making private land pollinator friendly, but I suppose a key factor that I'd be minded as your point one is, is farmland's key in it, because the majority of the ground within our council area uh, are controlled by farmers and it's getting the getting an incentive to them to, to, uh, to, to leave sections of ground. And I know that's outside our remit and that'll be, whatever sort of some sort of subsidy comes in in the future in regards to letting bits go uh go wild or, or natural or whatever you want to refer to it as but i i do understand as well if you can just touch on it there again leaving wee bits of the road and i'm thinking the road there outside um uh outside balanagori there's an overtaking lane there there's good wide verge and all the rest and bits of that there could be left go wild and, and into a, a wee wildflower meadow or whatever else but I would be minded it's not really a suitable thing for many of the minor and rural roads who effectively, if you're speaking to constituents, would be minded that they have been let go wild for, for quite some time because there's a, they're dangerous. They don't point telling any different. They are dangerous because the roads aren't getting cut, the sides of the road. So there's a place to get places cut, yes, but 
again, it's not going to be applicable right across the full council area. But no, definitely, Chair, all in all, welcome to the report and welcome to the work that's taken place. Thank you. Okay, just um, touch on a few points. I suppose we'll start off with DFI Road Service. Christine, um, just let Connor Cannon come on here for a second. Okay, go ahead, Connor. Yeah, Chair, thanks, Fab. It was just to say that that membership, um, as as a team, we are um, aware of all the sensitivities around um, you know, projects that we take forward, until, including the the uh, you know grow don't don't most of them, uh, and particularly comments with regard to assembly. So we, we will take that on board as part of the learning going forward, um, and and we you know, remember have concerns if they bring those directly to yourselves, Christine. You can certainly look at them in the wider team. Um, just with regard to the verges, um, particularly on rural roads, most of that will fall to DFI. Um, we cut up to the 30 mile um, zone beyond in some instances, but but anything beyond that will, will form, uh, fall to DFI. Uh, and again, just to pick up on the final point, we're keen to work with all partners, whether the private organisations or public uh, organisations, in terms of identifying lands and taking the project forward. Mindful again of all the, the other concerns, and particularly around health and safety when it comes to road bridges and so on. But again, look, uh, mindful of the concerns that members have raised with regards to certain aspects of this, and as a team, we we'll certainly take those on board and deal with them in a positive uh, manner. Go ahead, Christine. Thank you. Yeah, as Connor I mentioned there, DFI cuts along the side of the road. Um, and basically, there's a lot of logistical issues in terms of um, changing grass management there in terms of line of sight. And also, as well, we need to create three metre space of cutting that grass um, from the road verge. And then it needs to be a significant area so that we can then get in with our machinery. Um, so I think Connor's addressed a lot of that side of the road stuff. In terms of um, Strabane site, basically it needs to be quite a significant green space. If we're looking at creating at least one hectare, and it's normally more than that, on one of our public green spaces, we can't take away all that green space for public recreation. So we need to strike a balance of creating space for people and wildlife. The reason for the hectare size is that we need to be able to get our tractor and our Amazon in and be able to turn and make it worth their while to travel to that journey. We're having issues with some logistical issues with the machinery in terms of travel and long journey. So we're trying to keep we purchase a second machine so it can be based in Straban and the other machine to based in Derry in terms of the wheels aren't designed to, to basically travel that big a journey. So we're changing the machinery type in terms of the wheels um, to cope um, with them longer journeys and some of the site issues that we're having and also the shaft connection as well. So for the longer journeys as well. So there's some wee technical issues we're dealing with in, in the pilot period. Um, what else were you asking? But yes, the farmers, they, they're key. And the All Ireland Pollinator Plan have recognised that in Waterford and they've actually appointed a number of officers to start engaging specifically with farmland and to engage right across with the different farmer unions and with farmers right across the island um, to engage with them and encourage them to change their land management to dedicate a small space on their land for that. So um, that, that's something that's been addressed now as part of the new All Ireland Pollinator Plan. Thank you, Christine. Um, moving on to our next uh, councillor is Councillor O'Neill. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Christine, for presenting this really wonderful piece of work. Um, I think it's it's absolutely uh, brilliant to see, and um, you know, you are doing really, really great work. So I just want to commend you and uh, your co-workers for for the work that you are doing. Um, you know, I think that the fact that we've lost ninety seven percent of wildflower meadows. Um, is really alarming. I don't know what over what time frame that is. Um, um, so I don't know if you could if you could answer that. Um, and I think I think the key thing um, with the no more let it grow campaign. Um, I think there was really good public education around it uh, and awareness raising about it because it's almost like a shift in consciousness um, and and seeing things totally differently. So you're not seeing um, an area of uh, wildflowers or an area of of uh, wild growth as something that's not cared for, um, but it's actually in a way that like that we're caring more for for people and planet and and nature. Um, and you know I think you know we, we need to continue that that public education. And I know that you know I've been I, I feel like I've been on that journey in, in terms of really appreciating different weeds um, in my garden and and seeing their uses and things. And um, I was part of a great project a few years ago um, where we created a, a mural. Down on Rossville Street in the bog site, um, with uh, just in celebration of 
the wildflower um, which supports the bee um, entitled Weed Shall Overcome. Um, and uh, it was, um, you know, I think that that for me was a real, uh, you know, game changer in, in, in terms of seeing things uh, differently. And I, I really hope um, that, like, you know, you were saying that there are challenges in terms of like really just, you know, making this probably what you want it to be, where like um, it's it's wildflower meadows uh, everywhere that are just uh, buzzing and beautiful. But um, hopefully there will be more resource uh, that that will come, given that, you know, we're going to be cutting grass less uh, that can go then into developing uh, more meadows. Um, and then I was just going to ask around that, like, is there any initiatives that the like local communities uh, can get involved in? Um, that because I know that like I think you know people be be champing at the butt to plant trees or to sow wildflowers. Um, I know like in any tree planting um, projects I've been involved in, it's been um, it's been so well uh, attended. So like, is there any you know? So again, like could that be? An opportunity to address the resource because I know the local community would uh, would love to get involved, um, and uh, and then I, I just kind of like it was great to see that um, there's proactive work there with DFA, and really great to see that there's also proactive work uh, with farmers as well. Um, but I know that there's there's so much other like public land that's not council um, owned land, um, and you know. Like I, I work um in Alton Galvin and there's beautiful grounds. Uh, and I, I did used to work in Grantia and there's beautiful grounds um, you know, belonging to the Western Trust. So I did just want to make a proposal. Um, um, and I'll just put it in the uh chat box there. Just um to and it's just to determine um kind of what are the practices being done in these other pieces of public land, um, and how you can because council's doing brilliant work. How can council share that excellent work that you are doing with these public bodies, um, and and how can we work together going forward? So uh, that's just the, my proposal, and and thanks again, Christine. Um, I'll probably be uh, in contact to uh, to uh, follow up uh, on a few other things later. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Christine. Um, I'll so I suppose um, the first thing was you had asked about the 90% loss of wildflowers. So uh, that's over at, at least the last 60 years with changes in agricultural practice about increase in um, feed sizes and changes in practices on sites, um, mostly to do with agricultural land, but changes as well um, on public land. Um, just in terms of, I, you touched on about the management of the sites, we do actually cut along the verges along our sites and sometimes in larger sites we do more path through them and particularly in response as we touched on earlier with some of the cemeteries where we had received some feedback and um, we do um mow through a path so that people can see that the sites have not been neglected and there is a level of management going on there and they are all signed um there was a fund open there recently we did promote it on our web page and on social media that the live here love here fund was offering grants of up to twelve thousand pounds for rural areas um to create pollinator friendly um areas now our policy and it is the policy of the all Ireland pollinator plan is to encourage people to create a change in grass management so they don't have to actually purchase the seeds and it's just using what's naturally from the local area so it is just following our procedure which is to change the grass management to reduce your grass cuttings um, and to allow the meadow to grow flower and set its seed and cut and let that grass at the end of the season. We do we have created an animation video that's on our webpage to show people how they can do that. So that, that's the most simplest cost effective way and it won't cost anybody anything. It's just reducing your grass cutting on site. Um, we are as well as part of our pollinator plan engaging with our green infrastructure stakeholders um, to encourage them to change um, grass management on a number of their sites and we are looking on a minimum of five green infrastructure partners and one have already agreed to start that process. So we're delighted that they've taken on board and we do a lot of knowledge exchange with other councils. I just was on a knowledge exchange yesterday with ground maintenance, our ground maintenance staff and myself with Galway City Council and we've been engaging with Belfast and Limerick as well, sharing that knowledge, learning from them. Um, so we, it's, it's a learning process as we move forward. Um, so that, that's where we're at with that. Thank you, Christine. And 
I have Councillor Ferguson. Sorry, uh, yeah, Councillor Ferguson was seconded that uh, proposal that's on the chat box, and I have Councillor Jackson indicated to speak. Thanks, thanks, Chair. And I'm um, just coming on the um sort of like follow hours and, and congratulating Christine and the team for what for the work that you have done. Um, I've just a question around um and it may be. Maybe a midpoint, but a question around the, the wildflower seeds. Um, am I right in suggesting the council at, at one stage with providing the, the wildflower seeds? Um, and because I know I had been advising people that council um, were providing or had wildflower seeds um, for anybody that needed them. And I'm just querying around. Um, are those seeds native to this locality? And and I suppose just another practical step. Um, is there any advice um, from the team around when that when's the best time to plant wildflower seeds? If that's um, if if they if they are available. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it was a, a council motion. Passed um, in the spring of the year to. Um, to provide wildflower seeds, and um, it was to a range of schools and community groups and the public um, that seed has been distributed. Um, it was um, basically seed from Northern Ireland. Um, it's quite difficult to source um, seeds at the moment to do with Brexit and COVID. So we used a company in Northern Ireland, and the seeds are provenance, local provenance to Northern Ireland, but they're not from the dairy district, and that's why we're very, very keen on encouraging people to to just create wildflower meadows on their own ground. There's no cost involved, reducing their own grass cuttings, and it's the actual local seeds here from the district. So that that's our preference, and that's advice from the All Ireland Pollinator Plan as well. Um, in terms of planting, if you do choose to do that, um, you can plant them um, in the autumn for for the new spring growth. If that's your preference, and there is guidance on our web page as well on how to do that. Okay, thank you, um, members. We do have a proposal there, and it's in the chat box, and it's that council will write to the Environment Agency, the Housing Executive, Housing Associations, and the Western Trust to determine their current practices with land management for pollinators. We share the council's pollinator plan with these public bodies. To explore opportunities to work together to benefit the pollinators. And it's been saying that the councillor Ferguson and I'm saying some members that uh, would be unanimous and are support of that. Um, so members are no further indicated speakers. So Christine, thanks again for coming and presenting the council and I wish you well with the, the rollout of your, your work throughout the city and district. So thanks again. Thank you. And members, could I just get a proposal for that item? Councillor Tierney, Councillor Jackson, thank you. Uh, members, I'm conscious, conscious of the time. Um, we have two items left in open business. Um, so I would propose that we deal with them two items and then take a, a comfort break of 10 minutes if, if, if members are agreeable. It shouldn't take too long to get through these next two items. So, deal with item 12, which is Urban Rural Regeneration and Neighborhood Renewal Seminar, which is a recommendation. Proposed by Councillor Jackson. Seconded by Councillor Tierney. Good speaker. So members, that brings us to items for uh, information. I had mentioned earlier on item 17, and we're seeking nominees to the uh, stakeholder group. Why? Um, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Chair. Um, on behalf of Sean Fain, nominate Councillor Paul Fleming. Okay, Councillor Paul Fleming and Sean Fain. Councillor Tierney. Chair, um, on behalf of the SDLP, We'll nominate myself, please. Councillor Tierney on behalf of the SDLP. Councillor O'Neill is looking in there. 
yeah, I have a few points on the um, document as well. Are we will I save that for open for information and just give our nomination just now, Chair? Sorry, Councillor O'Neill didn't quite catch that. Sorry. Um, well, uh, for in terms of the nomination, um, I'll nominate myself for people before profit. I also want to speak to the document, but I can do that maybe after the break or or when would you like me to speak to the document? We'll take the nominations first, and then you can address it. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, Councillor Ferguson. Nothing on there. Chair, I was just going to. Sorry. Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Chair, and I'll nominate Alderman Hilary McClintock. Hilary McClintock from the DUP. And go ahead, Councillor Ferguson. Nominate myself, like a Chair for the Alliance. Thank you. An alliance nominee is Councillor Ferguson. Uh, if there's any independence on the. Um, Chair, did I hear uh, nominated on behalf of Council Municipal? Sorry, I didn't get that. He was after just not nominating myself on behalf of the LC in this party. Yeah, no problem, Alderman. So that's Alderman also on behalf of the UP. And maybe some independents could forward a nominee uh, to the relevant officer in the meantime. Um, go back now to uh, Councillor O'Neill, who wishes to address item 17. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was um, just firstly, um, just wondering, is there a start date of the ground investigation work? Uh, as it, in the document, it said it, it it might begin in the second week of October, which we're now in. So I don't know if Council have an update on that. Um, and I just also want to express um, my disappointment of the trial date postponement again. Um, it's you know now being pushed again to to next year. Um, and and just with regards to the public inquiry, um, which you know still has not happened into waste crime in the north, um, I just uh, want to propose that we uh, write a letter to the ministers for um, infrastructure and uh, minister of justice, given you know that this is a cross cutting issue uh, and therefore not a solely a decision for the. Um, Minister puts uh, to to say that the the public inquiry into illegal waste crime in the north isn't going to happen. So I just put that proposal there of a letter under the chat box, um, uh, just to follow up on the public inquiry and the efforts being done by those departments. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Um, can all members see the proposal? It's on the chat box and up on the screen. I have that up on the screen there for members in the chamber. Possible. Need a seconder as well for that. Anybody willing to second Councillor O'Neill's proposal? Councillor Ferguson is prepared to second it. And members, I don't envisage any opposition to that proposal, so take that as unanimous support for it. Uh, we'll bring Connor in here now, just so you can address the first part of that proposal. Thanks, Chair. I'll go back to uh, DIRA and get the information for the uh, concert on the works commencement at um, the boy site and get that to you directly. Thanks, Connor. Lemon Jose. Obviously not hearing us. Uh, may of you looking back in there? Go ahead. Sorry. Have you got me now? Yes, go ahead, all of them. <laughs> Sorry, I'll tell that. Um, we were nominating there for, for the seminar, but I, I'm noting 
that the event can be open to any interested member and relevant officers. Uh, for, for clarity, uh, have we agreed that we're taking the seminar as the kind, uh, you know, a specific council event for ourselves, in which know. case any member can attend, or have have you know has a proposal been that that we can go to the seminar in Belfast for clarity? The nominations are for the Mobile Stakeholder Group. The, the proposal for the seminar is open to all councillors. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Sorry if, if I'm confused here. Thank you. No problem. Um, Councillor Neil, were you looking back in there on the Mobile issue? Thank you. Okay. Members, uh, the rest of our agenda items for are for information so unless there's any anything anybody wants to raise Councillor Tierney Chair yeah, thank you um just quickly it's item number 24 um and it's just a quick question um in relation to 3.6 of the report um it's around Ballyarnett Country Park um 3.6 of the report talks about 200 thousand pounds worth of uh, works that would be anticipated to be carried out at Ballyarn Country Park. Um, first of all, obviously, we welcome the, the initial 10 grand um, that's, that's going to be spent there. Um, but around the, the 200 grand, that's quite a lot of money. Um, and obviously, I've spoken on this a number of times, and the officers will be aware that there is a currently a master plan, which is obviously in the, in the paper as well. What does the 200 grand do in relation to the master plan? Because when the master plan is rolled out, that could be a waste of that 200 grand, or what way is it going to work? Just yeah, sure. The 200 grand is to is to deal with the issues identified on the item around the past, the steps, and so on. I suppose you know, once we have more information where the master plan is, we bring a fuller report back to say it's going to happen or it's not going to happen, and look at the impact of it there. What we have done is is put that 200k into. Uh, the capital review group has an ask at this stage, but we will have to come back to it to say, are we willing to proceed at this time, or do we leave it until the master plan um, is approved and taken forward? So, when when do you think we're going to be um, asked that question? I suppose is, is the question, Master, because I would be, I suppose it's a worry for further on down the line, um, but I would just worry that. We may get word from the capital review that this 200 grand granted, which in current state probably isn't likely. But if it was, then two years down the line, the master plan might start rolling out. And I would just worry that that could be a waste of that 200 grand. Chair, um, I, I would say not. It's that these works are, are deemed as essential and they will inform part of the master plan as it's progressed. I think the issue is whether we would progress with the works. Knowing that you know if the funding was available for the master plan in the short term, which will probably is a different conversation. Um, but the works will not be uh, nugatory in that sense. The works are required no matter what we cut this up. Well, thank you, Connor. Um, and again, they welcome the report, Chair. Oh, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Neil indicated on items 19, 20, and 22. Councillor Duffy was looking on on the same. Um, item as Councillor Tierney there. Or do you want me to just go? Yeah, I'll take Councillor Duffy now. I'm just seeing her here in the chat box. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill, and thank you, Rory, um, for, for letting me on. I, it, it's just in terms of that Ballyarna Country Park item. And just to welcome the, the progress on it, I know I've been in touch with council officers many times, um, probably more so over the last year, around um, issues around anti-community behaviour, fires, um, bits of vandalism, stuff going on around, around the country park, which has resulted in it becoming um, less than what it should be. Um, let's say we do have the master plan, as um, Councillor Tierney has outlined, but in terms of the, the initial works, I'm, I'm glad to see that some of it is being progressed. Um, I know the wall at Cornshell Fields was um, one of the issues that, that I particularly had raised because, you know, it, it's a beautiful wall. Um, unfortunately, we 
I, I don't know, I'm not going to attribute um, vandalism to it, but something certainly happened to the wall. Um, so it's good to see that progressing. Um, just just in terms of the, the work that needs to be progressed in terms of the, the 200,000, I do agree that there, there is work that needs done, particularly ar around the steps, um, that that work is essential maintenance. I, I would agree with that. Um, I, I do, although hold, um, concerns around. I, I do want to see the master plan implemented as well, and there are huge ambitions for the park. Um, and I know that you know what one of the things was around um, trunk and electricity and around the actual play park, but to ensure that we we could get lighting, that we could get um, accessible toilets, all those things. So I, I do hope to see those issues coming before the capital um, working group as well. But in terms of the report in front of us, welcome the fact that there, there is progress. It's a beautiful country park and we need to be making the most of it and essential work needs to be carried out. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. I'll take uh, Councillor Neil now on item 19 and 20. I'll then take Councillor or Alderman Hussey on 21. And then back to Councillor Neil for 22. So go ahead, Councillor Neil. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, yeah, just on the Nature Positive 2030 report, um, there's um, the in, in Council's report of it, there's uh, nine priority actions for Nature Positive 2030. Um, and I think, um, you know, obviously this isn't a Council written report, you know, it's been uh, been written at a um, regional or national level. Um, However, I think the key thing missing from this is uh, rights of nature, so that nature can be, you know, protected and communities can can speak up for their local bits of nature. Um, and you know, I just kind of want to make that point because if we are looking at, you know, bringing this, uh, adopting this, uh, and and bringing it in line with our policy, I think we need to look at uh, adding a tenth, um, in in terms of adopting or uh or recognizing that, that nature has rights and 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 the fact that this is an ongoing process within our 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 council um i, I just want to make that point okay councillor and item 20 and i've also got councillor jackson on item 20. So go ahead councillor neil yeah item 20 um i just noted that um i i fed back some uh feedback for the response to the uh, second climate change bill going through Stormont at the moment. Um, and I just noted that um, there was um, a few times it came up, um, it just to quote it, certain elected members would be more supportive of an 82% target. So that the 82% target is the uh, target within the um, climate change bill number two. Um, and I just think like this contradicts corp a council's corporate position, which is in support of net zero uh, target. And, you know, I'm just not sure how that balances because I know it says certain elected members, but it, I feel it dilutes a council's response um, to the climate change bill number two. I, I don't dispute its, its truth, but in terms of council's corporate position, uh, in terms of not disputing its truth that certain elected members would be more supportive of an 82% target, you know, that is fact, but council's corporate position is uh, for a net zero uh, target. So, um, yes, I just want to kind of understand uh where council stands on that and uh you know has it already been submitted yeah in other words, i'd check that out and come back directly i was opposed i mean like council can have a, a corporate position individual members are free to have their own um view um, if that's reflected in, in the reply but certainly i will check out and get back to the member directly Councillor jackson Thanks, Chair. And I just want to um, congratulate the, the author of the response, um, Kathy. She the the detail on it is fantastic, um, and and it does highlight some of the concerns um, that is in line with Council's corporate position, um, although um, in in a constructive way. You no. Know, um, in terms of it does the, the response highlights the fact that this bill doesn't include a science based net zero target and it's the and, and it, it means that here in the six counties we're the only part of these islands that doesn't have that science based net zero target. Um I suppose that speaks to um the 
the department and, and who are putting it forward and that's uh and, and that, that in itself is disappointing but where at another element of the response it does highlight that the targets that are there are very weak and that data shouldn't shouldn't be given any powers because contained within this bill there's there's substantial powers afforded to data that they dilute and change the targets and that that's something that um it contained within our response is we feel that that it isn't appropriate if there's any changes to the targets they should be it should be the the increased ambition of reducing our carbon emissions and that's i just want to commend the officer for the work contained that we um drawn up the response and that's what it's, it's taken into consideration as the legislation goes through. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Um, moving on now to item 21, um, Alderman Hussey wishes to raise his issue. Uh, thank you, Chair. I also want to come in on item uh, 23. Uh, all, 21 is the rollout of the brown bands, which was alluded to earlier on there. Is there a concluding date for, for that program to be finished? Chair, I would like to get it concluded within the next 12 months, um, subject to um, just teasing out the last logistic issues and say we're trying to um, allocate and schedule trucks um, to free up capacity. Now, we're also going through a route optimization process within uh, refuse collection at the moment. Uh, members will have you know, heard this discussed before. It's looking at all the routes in the most effective and efficient way uh, to collect those. Now, that will free capacity, and then it's moving that capacity around um, to ensure that we can pick up those properties not currently on the bio waste collections. So I would like to see it complete within uh, 12 months. I know that that seems a way out, but there's a fair bit of work in moving collections around, notifying uh, residents of possible changes to collection days and so on. And that just takes time to coordinate. And I think with all, with all of these um, initiatives, it's important to get it right. Um, so that, that's where the time comes in. But again, the commitment remains to ensure that every property who can avail of a bio waste collection is included on a collection route. Thank you, uh, Connor, and thank you, Chair. Uh, can I go to item 23, or do you want me to hold? No, I'll take uh, Councillor O'Neill now on 22. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I, I at first have like several comments and questions on the reports uh, and then depending on the answer to these questions, um, I would like to make a few proposals um, if that's OK. So um, so I want to come back and after the answers, uh, basically. Um, is that all right? OK, so um, so just first of all, uh, the numbers in this report, um, you know, from reading them and and from uh, I suppose this is an area of, of interest for me. Um, they, they're just in total contradiction to the circular economy zero waste strategy that Council adopted in December 2017. Um, and I think there's actually many errors in the report. Um, and I, I want to just kind of put down a few observations on these errors. Um, so this report has assumed no, no improvement in recycling performance from switching to three weekly residual uh, which seems crazy to me because every trial or rollout of source separation that I know of has seen a notable reduction in residual um, waste and improved recycling performance and therefore has delivered financial savings. Um, there's also no evidence source provided um, for the claim uh, for, carb, for a curb sort that uh, conversely, so this is what it, what it says in the report, conversely evidence would demonstrate a set out rate of the curbside sort system to be in the region of 60%. So there's no there's no like there's no uh, source provided for that, and this is a low participation rate, particularly when residual capacity is constrained and residents are incentivized to recycle. And this will influence the overall results, since this is their justification for reduced recycling yields on curb sort. And um, the there's a higher residual waste disposal cost as well. Um, that's been applied to future scenarios compared to the baseline, and there's no obvious justification for this. Um, and again, on, on the curb sort, as as on the original modelling, they've included a gate fee, uh, and this seems quite high for only a waste transport station. And there's no material income 
uh, which is actually really, really key because this is where we actually make income for the council by collecting high quality recycling. It has a higher commodity value and then it can provide income for our council. So this, this figure is not included in the report at all. And, um, you know, the question has to be asked, how do we feel that our business as usual situation will deliver recycling rate targets when it's been in place for some time and, and it has, hasn't done so far? So, so my questions, um, I do have a few questions on this. So, first of all, how do you explain the variance between these figures and the reports and those in the circular economy zero waste strategy? And I know there's been several years between that, but the technology is only improved when it comes to recycling. Um, uh, the second question is uh, the consultant WDR Taggarts, they like from reading that they feel they appear very negative throughout the report about the curbside source scenarios two to four. Um, and so like I do have questions that like how can we be sure that Taggarts are a reliably impartial consultant and were they like required an appointment to declare any business interests or relationships? Um, and uh, like, how was the weighting of the tender designed to ensure we got, you know, the best researchers ex experienced um, in this field? And uh, just in terms of the refuge collection vehicles, they're treated as free for over a seven year period. Um, so scenario one's recycling vehicles cost nothing over seven years, um, whereas the vehicles in scenarios two to four are priced in. So like, again, there's cost questions there. Um, again, like, why are the gate fees used for all scenarios the same? Because again, like, it doesn't cost the same to sort blue bin material, um, because that material is already separated, and then like, there's a value on those materials that are separated. Um, and you know, was there, you know, where did Tiger seek their expert advice on on that curbside sort model uh, to get those figures, um, and then. Again, just around questions, just around the the numbers, uh, around the thirty frontline curb sort vehicles that will be required. Um, you know, again, did they speak like the like wheels? Uh, like um, wheels are like the third best recycler in the world. So, like, I'm wondering that they speak to any of those rural councils and wheels. Um, where they use an identical model uh, to that proposed in scenario four for guidance. Um, and then. Um, just a few more questions, but was the report peer reviewed by RAP, um, who act as advisors to council in these matters? And you know, speaking of RAP, when the when the first uh, report of this came out in November, um, was there any feedback from external parties um, on on that report in November? Um, and yeah, in terms of like again, like scenarios two to four. Like the report fails to mention any um, like money that could be claimed f from a grant from DERA, um, which could save the council significant amounts um, and and again change the the outcome of the the figures in the report. Um, so that's my questions, um, and I do have a few proposals depending on those answers. Thanks, sure. Chair. I'll, I'll answer as many of these as I can today. In terms of the information used to form the basis of the report, it was taken from um, the experiences of other councils who are currently using um, curbside sort uh, and box systems, and there are a number of those across NIE. So, uh, as I understand it, the methodology involved talking with those councils directly and using that to look at participation rates, capture rates, and, and all of the other data uh, that's mentioned within there. In terms of material income, the experience to date is that um, and certainly been the experience of this council when we operated a box um, uh, pilot system previously, we didn't get any income. Um, and again, that seems to be the experience across NIA at the moment, whilst um, there is a, a revenue generated from the sale of materials, very little of any of that comes back to councils. Uh, and again, that's based on the feedback that um, the authors of the report used to, um, or used to, to uh, populate the information. In terms of the procurement of the, the consultants, um, members will know that we have to have an open and transparent procurement process where we set out the criteria, the evaluation criteria in advance, and it's free and open for any company to um, to bid into that. Um, and some companies did in terms of consult consultants, and some didn't. Uh, but that's a matter for the market, and council um, can't influence that in terms of either writing um, 
uh, a specification that it, that would exclude or uh, you know be, be seen as preferential to one uh, company or another. So those are clearly defined procurement issues. Um, in terms of the the vehicle costs, I mean the report is based on using current vehicles for for collection. Um, if we have to buy a curbside sort, they come at a cost that we currently haven't provided or allowed for. So that would be an additional cost in terms of that. Uh, and again, the issues with regard to the, the material sort, when you collect material separately, you have to have somewhere to store that material separately prior to um, onward transport, which again must be done separately. So those are additional costs that come into play once you go down that route. Um, on, the, on the understanding or a basis, I suppose, that you don't have a, a, a treatment facility, a MRF, on your door that can take that material directly. Where that's not the case, you have to allow a transfer station and logistics to be able to move that material on to uh, the destination for further sorting. All of the material requires sorting at some point. Um, you know, cans will be sorted out into aluminium and steel, so there's a, a sort uh, facility required for that. Plastic bottles will again be sorted out into different um, you know, grades of plastic. So you know, all of those add costs along the way. Um, again, mention was, was made to Wales. That the collection systems and um, a lot of all of the capital costs were covered in terms of the Wales executive, including all the infrastructure. And there was a director from, uh, as I understand it, from government to, to move to that direction of travel. We don't have that um, central government directive here at this point in time. Um, and it will be a matter for councils to consider all of the other issues around costs um, uh, and you know, all the other issues as identified in the, port and, uh, in the report and make a decision around that. And whilst there are DERA grants available, um, those um, going forward are only 50% of any capital involved and they won't cover any additional revenue um, in terms of um, you know, additional manpower or any other ongoing costs that arise from changing um, collection routes. Um, and, and the report simply does what members have asked you, but to consider and model all of the other um, collection um, options as, as identified in the initial report. Um, so, you know, that's that's what, what um, it's set out to do. Um, I can certainly go back to the consultants and get um, the details of the background data that led, uh, that gives rise to the conclusions. Um, but as I say, it's based on the experiences of other councils um, and those who are currently operating curbside systems. And sure, Neil. Yeah, I I don't feel um, like I just have like far too many questions. Like you know, and, and looking at the numbers, like you know, I think we're you know talking you know potentially three million like you know of errors, um, three million pounds of errors, and in this report, um, like you know, you know, obviously I'm a member of Zero Waste Northwest. You know, this is something that I've uh, loved and breathed for quite a few years, um, and. Um, you know, in my spare time, I remember whenever this report came to council in November as a citizen, I I was, I, you know, I listened in, I, um, you know, I, I read the papers and things. Um, and I, I just feel that given that we have two completely contradictory reports, one from, you know, Mia, who are, who are experts in um, zero waste circular economy, which our, our council are signed up to, are committed to, um, and then one from um, uh, Tiger Group, which which is seems to um, favour uh, the business as usual system. Like I, I want to propose that we have a peer review of this report from RAP, um, who are the independent experts in this field and and already advising government. Um, and again, you know, uh, with Wales, um, like they've gone from they, they are now the. Uh, best in the UK when it comes to recycling. They're second best in Europe and they're third best in the world. And yes, they, they had like central government support. Um, but you know, they also you know that that transition also required local municipalities to lead. You know, it required them to commit to this change and, and be brave in this change. And you know, like, you know, I think uh, you know, we we need to follow uh follow what they're doing. Um and, and the thing is the the model that they're using as as the the Bryson model, which you know, um, you know they're just they're they're a company in the north, and you know, um, in no way saying that you know we should just just get Bryson to do um our recycling because I think it's great that it's an in house service that we do because it's council jobs, and I think in terms of uh you know 
whenever that uh, tiger company engage with other councils, you know, they're not getting income, income or revenue. Um, well, it's because uh, Bryson do the do the job for them. So, uh, you know, that it's them that make the it's a social enterprise. They uh, they're the ones making the money from this. So that's why I think if we keep this in house, but I think that we um, should invite uh, Bryson Recycling to present on their collection methods. I'm not sure if council have had them on before. Um, and to also present on the economic and environmental, uh, you know, uh, impacts of this model and how our council um, could learn from this expertise to explore an in-house curbside sort system for our council area. Um, and then, like, go, you know, going back to the um, zero, the circular economy, zero waste strategy um, from 2017. Um, like there was a lot of work and a lot of effort that 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 really went into to bring that forward, and it was really uh, it was really um, cutting edge at the time. Um, and you know, I, I, you know, I want to see about uh, an update on the thirty seven policies. If, if council could present the report on an update of those thirty seven policies within that strategy, um, uh, you know, since since it was passed in December twenty seventeen. And then specifically on policy 31, I'll, I'll put all these proposals, by the way, in the chat box, um, but specifically on policy 31, um, the, it states that the council will establish a thank and do tank to support the strategy and define ongoing council commitment uh, to support. It will define clear terms of reference for the operation of the thank and do tank. Um, and again, this thank and do tank, I'll, I'll, and I'll quote from the strategy, is a core outcome of the strategy this think and do tank will go wider than council's room at that Please. Hey. Okay. Remarks to close, please. Sorry, yeah, I'm just, I know it's 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 a big, big report and it's a big complex uh, topic. Uh, but basically the think and do tank has not been established and it's the, it's the element of the strategy that drives us forward in terms of the implementation of a circular economy, zero waste uh, city region. So I'll just put these uh, proposals in the chat box, Chair. Um, and response. Hopefully that's okay. Thanks, Sean Lee. I'm 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 informed that because these items are for information, it's, it's not really the appropriate um, course of action for multiple proposals to come on. So if you wish to forward questions to officers because there's no recommendations essentially in these reports and they would be uh, content then to come back with that information to you so i'm not going to accept any um proposals at this stage yeah i feel uh, like the recommendation from the report is to do nothing and you know <laughs> um you know i i do have serious questions on that report and you know i think at least to have a peer review from rap you know as essential yeah, well, if you wish to raise it again, I, w I would suggest maybe that you raise it under matters or, or at the full council meeting um, at the end of the month. Uh, Councillor Dobbins. Thank you, Chair. Sorry there, I couldn't get on mute. Chair, I agree with you, and um, I'm not in any way diminishing what Councillor O'Neill has to say. But but she lost me halfway through, and um, there's so many questions there. Trying to keep up was um, a bit difficult for myself. I I would suggest that maybe Councillor O'Neill have a one to one with an officer, um, preferably Connor, and thrash out what her concerns are, and then come back to us with her concerns. You know if she still has them. You know that or that information that she thinks needs to be raised um with us you know and and take it from there but i'm sorry that to me went round the houses a bit and um whilst i am all for uh the circular economy and everything and everything uh, environmental i got lost halfway through that so um i'm glad that you had said what you had said chair thank you uh, um just councillor o'neill um you know items from information are essentially for that purpose if you have a quick query around it we're prepared to take it you know but 
you know, I, I would ask that maybe you would go away and maybe have a discussion with the officers, submit your questions. If you feel it still needs a proposal, then bring it to full council. So, members, thank you for your patience. Members, I was going to suggest a 10 minute recess, however, we have two quick items within confidential. Um, um, intent if, if members are to, to rattle rattle on through them and hopefully we'll conclude it quick enough. Sure. Yes, right. Chair, you bypass me on item 23. Sorry, Chair, item 23, Alderman Hussey. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, the Streetscape Public Realm COVID Recovery Revitalization Program uh, and 2.2, excellent, uh, whereby uh, three departments came together, Department uh, DFC, DFA, and DERA. Uh, uh, and the DERA element of that funding was used to distribute business support grants within the rural part of the council district. Uh, as we move forward, uh, we look at ongoing projects on 3.2. The relevant projects are all listed on 3.2 and they're in the city and in Straban. And if we look down to 4.2 within the report, funding to these schemes is derived from DFC and DERA, Recovery Revitalization Grant Program at a rate of 100%. Um, so am I right in thinking then that at the beginning of this, the DERA money was going where it should do, to the rural community, whereas now uh, the DERA money that's available has been taken off the rural community and is now being utilised within the urban community. Um, I mean, at the beginning, there was a good balance whereby the COVID recovery scheme, the programme, revitalisation programme, did reach out to the rural area. Whereas it seems now, uh, as we go on, and the rural community, the rural settlements are still trying to recover from the, the, the COVID scenario in exactly the same way as the urban community is. Yet it seems that they are now being abandoned and indeed money coming from a department with responsibility for rural affairs is going to urban projects. Thank you, Chair. I'll bring Tony on here. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and just in response to uh, Alderman Hussey, uh, there appears to be a small typo in that um, section there because it really should have read. It was a generic reference to the fact that, that the funding we're getting is from all three um, all three government departments. But to clarify, uh, from a perspective of DERA, DERA funding is being used only on the business grants element that has been distributed in the rural area and being administered by our business and culture team. So again, apologies for any confusion that's caused. And just to clarify that the DERA money is being spent in the rural area for business support grant purposes only. Thank you. Uh, okay, appreciate that. that. Thanks thank for the clarification, Chair. Thank you, Tony. Councillor Kelly, you had indicated um, for item 18. It's fine, Chair. I'll pick up directly with the officer. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Members, uh, we've only um, three items in confidential, so I think we'll rattle on and, and shouldn't take us too long to get through it. So if I could have a proposal and second. Or we'll proposed to Alderman Devenay, Chair. Second to Derek. Alderman uh, Devenay and Alderman Hussey. And Paul, let us know when we're 